Greetings, peace, and blessings, shalom, shalom to all the Hebrew camps, congregation, Knesset, the nations, the Nethanims. I am Chief Priest Banyala of the House of Wisdom, joined today by my reader, Apprentice Priest Samak, and Executive Priest Yara Dunn. Today's class is titled, Living Waters. We are now concluding the second week of the Feast of Seven Weeks, and the Heavenly Father has mandated each and every one of us to come to his feast. And we're going to be talking about the parabolic meanings of this feast, but also the actual upfront basic meaning of it that each and every one of us got to attain. You know, we have busied ourselves in the celebrations of the world. You know, before we came into this covenant, you know, a 4th of July couldn't come by without you blowing up some firecrackers or a Christmas or uh, a Easter or whatever it was. But it seems to me that when it comes to the worship of the Heavenly Father, being introduced again to the truth, we kind of get a little lackadaisical, a little slack, a little complacent with the will and the rules of the Heavenly Father. We all must get fired up. We're going to talk about that today, that the Heavenly Father is now getting us in our agrarian roots, in our our uh, our past history. We were people of the dirt, people of the earth. We were people that knew seasons and times. And we knew that if you did not plant, you did not eat. If you did not sow, you would not reap. And so this now is the time for us to sow. So that at the end of the seventh week, the 50th day, so-called Pentecost, that we all may receive a blessing. But there are those of us who are putting in very little work. But we expect to speak in tongues on the 50th day. We expect miracles to happen in our world. This will not and cannot be the case. But first, in this intro, let's talk about some current events that are going on. The Supreme Court just ruled that uh, Roe versus Wade, the abortions, uh, is not a constitutional right anymore. Let's get to the essence of this abortion bill. You know, I've seen the president talk about, you know, with a straight face, how it is a woman's right. And it is like molesting a woman. Taking this right to murder and butcher and slaughter her child and then give it over to the medical professionals to sell the eyes and they can experiment with the intestines and the feet and the blood and the plasma. This is your right to do that. We have been sold, we have been led astray by the powers that be. We're going to start first. Get Exodus, if you will, Samak. Exodus, the first chapter. And then we're going to get the eight verse, getting right to the point. This is nothing new. They have been doing this since the first millennium, trying to exterminate, abort, trying to get rid of the saints before we even come upon the scene. But in this last, this sixth millennium, somehow the powers that be have indoctrinated our women to think that this is a good thing. It is amazing. It is your fundamental right to murder, butcher, slander, blender your baby up in some strange scientific concoction. This is a right. This is not a right. You have been beguiled. Once again, Exodus 1 verse 8. And if you would, preach you done, if you'll get Exodus 21 verse 22 as I said before and there's another thing that happened uh, they now finally said New York Jersey a lot of those northeastern states those who are in the states uh, must now allow people to exert their second amendment or their second constitutional right All right which is to bear arms they have been robbing the people of this for decades it seemed and now people in New York it appears can defend themselves you know, with firearms, if you're, you know, doing it legal, not advise everybody in the states who can. If you can legally obtain, legally obtain. 
Carry your sword. You never know when you may need to protect yourself and your family. Just keep everything uh, legal. Let me say that. But let's get back to the salient point at hand. Exodus 1, verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Didn't read that. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there fall out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. So now we find that the Egyptians in antiquity were concerned about the multiplying of the children of Israel. And so much so that they began to outnumber the indigenous Egyptians of the land. And they was truly concerned. They said, let us strategize. Let us come up with a plot and a scheme. At least they join our enemies and overpower us. At least they outnumber us. Let's diminish them. Let's read. Exodus, Exodus 11. Therefore, they did set over them. Exodus 1 verse 11. Let's read. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters. They set over them slave patrols. To afflict them. They set over them hard policing. They set over them all types of people that were antithetical to them growing. They already said we have to depopulate. So let's make sure that we put some austere measures out there and some people that are ambivalent and filled with hatred toward them. This is very reminiscent of what we have today. All of this is to keep the children of Israel at bay. Minimize them. Let's read. With their burnings, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, panthems, and remis. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So the children of Israel were resilient. And they was grieved because the children of Israel, when they afflicted them in these city, Pethom and Ramses, they were really, really perplexed. What, we can, what can we do to exterminate these buggers who may take us over. Let's continue. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of services in the field. All their services wherein they made, their, made them serve with, was with rigor. All right. So they made life a living hell for the saints during that time. But still, we strived and we thrived and we reached that higher calling. And they could not stand it, not unlike today. Things could be better. Things could be easier. The people of Israel could be educated. We could be trained and taught what is good, what is not good. But it is not toward the Egyptians' benefit to teach us because, again, we would rise. Let's read. Exodus 1 verse 15 and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives so now check this out the powers that be went to the sisters let me talk to you black woman let's read of which the name of one was Sapphora and the name of the other Pua and he said when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now we find the king going to Shifra and going to the midrise, Pua, and saying, if when you have a Hebrew child, if it be a male child, because he is our most formidable enemy, he is the one that poses a threat, you kill him, but the women you let alive. And so they begin to indoctrinate, inculcate into the minds of the sister this division as we have today. When we was on the plantation, there was no black man, you get to the front, women get to the back. It was all of you guys. A bunch of slaves, chattels. You guys are my property. 
during Reconstruction or the Civil Rights period, it wasn't black men to the front and black women to the back. All of you to the back. But now that there's a little smell, a little taste of liberation, it is, I want my feminine rights. You haven't even got your national rights. And I'm talking about Hebrew Israelite rights. But divide and you conquer. Like Pharaoh began to sprinkle those seeds. Look, women, all the women can live. But all of those nasty, dirty men must die. Not knowing that they, by way of the Magi's, caught wind that prophets were coming. Strong men were coming. The Moseses are coming. The the, 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 the straight prophets of the Most High testifying what is good, what is not. The law was getting ready to come to the children of Israel. And so they wanted to slay, slaughter, bring to an end the children by way of the men as soon as they be born. They knew that Aaron was getting ready to step on the scene just like they know it today. They know it. See, they may be able to handle a nation of women but they certainly cannot handle a nation of men and women unified in the covenant of the Most High, slaying, filleting, burning, eviscerating those evil spirits of sin. And so in the days of old, they knew it, and this is why they have it today. They have indoctrinated our sisters to think that this is something good. Abortions is something great. Let's read on. Exodus chapter 1, verse 16. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to a Hebrew woman, and she them upon the stools, and if it shall be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then ye shall live. All right. And if it's a daughter, she shall live. Because in antiquity, they knew that the men were more of a fighter than the women. And they knew that the Most High was sending forth a Moses and an Aaron. They knew that they were sitting forth a Miriam as well. But what they really did not want is for these men, the head of the nation, the head of the family, to rise up and begin to do what all of the Magi's prophesied was coming and overthrow a Pharaoh's kingdom. So they made it a law. Imagine a constitutional right to do what? Jump down to the 22nd verse. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. He said, that's it. That's the law of the land. That's the law of the land. Just like it was now, and it's got, you know, thwarted or overturned. Now the sisters are saying, what am I going to do about my yearly abortion? I have one every year. What am I going to do? How about this? Live godly. How about this? Get married. How about this? Raise a family. Did that thought ever come to you? The most I gave you a uterus for that reason. But you know, living in a hard world, you began to make hard and difficult choices. But it's time for us to come out of this rigorous world, this hard world, where you have to even think about abortion. I'm not coming down on the sisters. I understand why they make those choices, because they're in the world. And they can't have a child to impede upon their income or a child too much responsibility or whatever it may be but whatever it is is not a reason so let's not get on the bandwagon and start flooding the streets in the weeks to come talking about you want a new supreme court or whatever 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 scheme they come up with realize the most high is giving you a short period of time a short moment of time to get your act together this is antithetical to your nation, antithetical to you, antithetical to your well-being, and to your spiritual connection with the Heavenly Father. If you will, Priest Yeridan, get it in Exodus 21, verse 22. If a man strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So if a woman is pregnant and a man is frolicking around, fall back, and then she's damaged or the baby has some kind of abnormality about it, he has to pay. This is how much the most I love the child in the womb. He has to pay. But if it went further, read. Verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. If the baby didn't make it, Bro, I know you was drunk and you was trying to dance and you was frolicking around and you fell back on my wife and my baby died. Uh, the judge want to see you, sir. 
the gallows are waiting for you. You touch that baby and you caused it to die, you give life for life. These doctors got like a thousand life sentences that they have to pay for. And these congressmen and senators and these Supreme Court judges who passed that garbage has hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives, blood upon their hands. Let's finish that. Verse 24. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Wow. Most are saying, as the baby has died, you shall die. You burnt it, you must be burned. You got rid of his eye, one of your eyes got to go. If you went in with a scalpel and clipped off his foot, let's start with your foot. And then you work your way on up to his ankle and his knee, well, your ankle and knee is next. And if you clipped off his head, then your head would be clipped off too. The Most High is saying be very careful about that precious fruit that he has caused to conceive in the womb of women. But we treat that like it's yesterday's trash. Like it's something that's not important or real. And that goes on throughout, even after the birth. We treat human life like it's nothing. The Heavenly Father prophesied that we will live in these days where human life should not be worth anything. But we know that mankind was created to worship the Heavenly Father. And he is going to bring again men on the earth who's more precious than fine gold, even the gold of you fast. He's bringing prophets and prophetess again upon this earth. And we know that the dragon is spewing out his fire trying to exterminate us at any and every turn. Let us walk cautiously in these times. Let us understand that we are finishing up the second week. And let us understand the importance of each and every week. Abba willing, we're going to be talking about the details of the second week and preparing everybody for the third week of this feast of weeks unto the Heavenly Father. We're going to now go to the announcements with Executive Priest Jerry Dunn. Shalom, peace and blessings to all the brothers and sisters. I'm Priest Jerry Dunn. Bring forth the announcements for today. Remember, we've concluded the second week of the Feast of Weeks. We're going to now the third week. We're counting now up to the third Sabbath until we count seven Sabbaths. Then on the following day, we'll have the 50th day called Pentecost. To register for this feast, uh, register on our website at shekinai.com slash feast registration. I'll be willing that registration will be posted live very soon. So brothers and sisters can join us for the Feast of the Most High, giving up his oblations and sacrifices in due season. With that being said, throughout this Feast of Pentecost, or this Feast of Weeks, this is a Feast of Harvest and bringing in our first fruits, the ripe harvest that's used for the worship of the Heavenly Father. To do so in these days, we must continue to harvest the fruits of the Spirit, as Priest Gabaria took us through last week. Let us make sure we're bringing forth our virtue as due sacrifice to the Most High. And while we're bringing forth that spiritual fruit, let's be mindful to bring in the tithes to fill the storehouses, as is written in Malachi 3, to fill the storehouses with the, so that there may be meat in the house of the Heavenly Father. And when we do that, when the storehouses are filled with tithes, then the Most High will rebuke the devourer. Then he will condemn and curse Satan instead of cursing us, and he will remove Deuteronomy 28 off of the saints and on to those who seek to curse us and not those who bless us. To bring in the tithes of today, tithes are not money. Tithes are not, you know, your dollar bills. The Most High does not want that. He wants his oblations, and he wants the priesthood to give the oblation with the meat offering, the drink offering, the oil, the salt, the incense, and all of these things. So to bring in the tithe offerings, go to our website, shekinai.com slash tithes to order your tithes that can be shipped to the priesthood here at the House of Wisdom or shipped to you directly for those who are partaking in the oblations on the oblation line. Uh, the tithes, once again, are flour, as you see here, the daily bread that we have prepared, the wine, the drink offering. We have alcoholic and non-alcoholic wines available for those of all ages. And we have varieties of wine for people of ver uh, various tastes. Uh, we have the salt, we have the incense as well. Uh, definitely go to our website, shekinai.com slash tithes to procure your tithes and to send those to fill up the storehouse here so that there is no lack in the oblations. We must be mindful to do this throughout this feast uh, so that 
the feast is done perfectly and that the oblations never cease. Uh, with that being said, uh, we made sure that the tights were on our website and available so that the best ingredients possible are used in the oblations. Uh, we're no longer accepting tights from outside sources uh, because we don't know the quality of some of these things that are being shipped in. We don't know if these things are contaminated with boll weevils that go and eat the flour. That is an unclean thing that we cannot offer to Heavenly Father. And those sometimes run through this flour. Same thing with the wine. Did you know that some wines are not vegan? This may be an example of a vegan wine, but is your choice of wine vegan? Did you know that they have a fining process where they filter it with gelatin from pork or unclean fish? Some of us don't, but that's why the House of Wisdom took it upon ourselves to ensure that the wine, the drink offering used is the best possible vegan, organic, non-GMO blood of grapes that's used for the oblations. So we're no longer accepting outside sources of wine, grape juice, oil, or flour because we have ensured that the ingredients used in these tithe offerings are the best possible. Uh, so definitely go to our website, shekinai.com slash tithes to give your true tithe offerings. And while we're giving our tithes, the Mosai requires us and wants us to voluntarily give all manners of offerings, our free will offerings, which you can give of anything that you find of value, whether it be cloth, furniture, garments, or even monies. There is no law of 10% of your money. This 10% of your agricultural goods that you harvest and brought in, that is a mandate. That is a commandment. But your monies you freely give as much as the Most High has blessed you with and what you want to bless the Heavenly Father with. Uh, you can give as much or as little as you want, but make sure you are giving your offerings freely to the Heavenly Father to make sure that the priesthood can continue in the works that the Most High has set us on. Uh, we have some great plans and uh, great goals but we need the support of the congregation uh, that to diligently support so to make sure that the priesthood is able to maintain everything that we're seeking to do. Also, with that being said, the calendar. I know everybody is waiting patiently for the calendar, but remember the House of Wisdom is no longer doing calendars. We are now doing calendrical study guides. These things are books. They're way beyond our first calendar, which was 12 pages. If anybody has been watching the House of Wisdom way back from 2018, you remember that calendar, that's 12 page. That was, that was not a calendrical study guide, that was a calendar. But then, incrementally, wisdom has allowed us to grow. And our next calendar that we did, it was still a calendar, but we put a little more information in it. Last year's though, the fourth edition that we did was a calendrical study guide. A thick 80 page booklet of a variety of information uh, that is needed for the saints to study daily throughout these years as we come to serve the Heavenly Father. This year has been beefed up even more. This document is uh, touching on 120 pages of straight, thorough information uh, with the work of great artwork as well implanted in this to make it a beautiful study guide for the saints on how to live our lives throughout these years as we count down the curse of Adam. So you definitely want to get one of these 2022 through 2023 calendrical study guides. There's great information about there. We focus heavily on the moon and what its purpose is. Uh, if you've been following the moon for a counting of time, or if you just don't know what the moon is for, you definitely need to get this calendrical study guide and study it and see how the moon is used for us as an agrarian society. And also, there's some information in there that I think is going to knock the socks off, so to speak, of everybody who gets it. So you definitely want to get this year's Calendrical Study Guide. Uh, you can register uh, to sign up for a, a newsletter where we will make sure we email you when the printed copies are available. The digital copies are available. We want to make sure we print them out. We've sent them off to printers. Uh, we're getting everything ready to make sure that we have those copies available. And most I willing will be sending both the digital copy and the physical copy out at the same time. So the calendar is ready. We're just going now to printing 
and most I will, and we'll let everybody know when it's available. So go to our website, shekinai.com slash calendar to join the newsletter so you can be notified as soon as the calendar and some of the classes you want to do with it are available and ready to go. Definitely an important part uh, for those saints that want to study and be close to the Heavenly Father. Also, we have the health and wellness line. Um, we have, for one, the living waters, uh, the temple blend, for example. These products that we have are essential for the health of the saints. We come with the classes and the oblations for the spiritual health of the saints, but we need to make sure that the vessel that the spirit is dwelling in is healthy as well. So we cannot neglect the flesh. You definitely want to get these living waters, uh, the temple blend for your daily regimen of your health and wellness. This is a blend of colloidal silver, copper, and gold. There's, all of these are essential for the health of your physical body. The silver is antibacterial, antiviral. The copper is actually needed for your body to function. If you have zero copper in your body, your body will shut down and die. So you need small amounts, trace amounts of copper like you find in the double in the um, Living Waters Temple Blend. Uh, also, the gold is good for your cognitive function and keeping your spirit right and sharp and on point. So definitely get the Living Waters. You can go to our website, shekinai.com slash health and wellness to get this in a variety of sizes. Uh, we have small dropper sizes for an individual that just wants to take a few drops every day. We have four ounce spray bottles and also eight ounce and 16 ounces available. Also, uh, most of when we're going to be uh, restocking on the double onyx. Uh, this is part of our health and wellness line of the Living Waters. This is a blend of, this is a power pack blend that goes and kills all types of viruses, fungi, uh, bacteria, and all things that bring forth diseases. You know, there's a, a particular one that's been spreading around recently that's been in the news, uh, and instead of getting a jab, we recommend the saints use the natural products of the Most High put on this earth that the saints have done, the priest has put together in a bottle that's power packed to fight against these viruses and all these things that are coming against us in these days. So as we start to restock on the double onyx, we'll let everybody know in these announcements on the videos, Most High willing, and you can get those at shekinai.com slash health. And stay tuned for some of the other products that we plan on bringing out for the health and wellness line uh, so that the saints can have bodies fit for the spirit of wisdom to dwell within. Also, most I willing, we'll be coming out with the true fringe line on our website. I know ever since the devil's fringes has been out, many people have been asking, how do I get the true fringes? The fringes are not tassels. You don't see tassels on my shirt. You see a hem or four hems, one at the neck, two at the arms, and one at the bottom of the torso, sealed with a ribbon of blue. Most I will, I'm gonna have shirts like these polos and the t-shirts, uh, along with women's dresses, uh, available on the House of Wisdom website, shekinai.com slash true fringe. I'll be willing, we're gonna have these garments available very, very soon. So definitely stay tuned if you want to get some of these garments uh, for you or your household to be in line with the Heavenly Father, looking like the temple that we all are. And uh, with all that being said, um, we have many things going on. Let's make sure we're registering for the feast, getting our tithes, getting our health and wellness products and everything that we need uh, for the worship of the Heavenly Father. And lastly, as we conclude the announcements, let's make sure that those who are looking to worship the Heavenly Father and understand how and what your particular purpose is, join the classes available at the House of Wisdom. We have the Apprentice Priesthood class where we teach brethren how to engage in the oblations and sacrifices of the Heavenly Father. For those who are called to be priests or porters or holy singers, join the priesthood class. Uh, you can register at shekinai.com slash priest application to apply for the priesthood class uh, so that we can have an abundance of priests ready to give up oblations and sacrifices in due season as commanded and required of us. For daughters and women of Zion who are looking to serve the Heavenly Father in their capacity as well, Join the Daughters of Wisdom class that is available here at the House of Wisdom. Uh, you can email us at, sh at houseofwisdom at shekinai.com 
and request info on the Dollars of Wisdom class and Most High Willing will get back with you as soon as possible to join that class that we do that we use to train sisters on how to worship the Heavenly Father and how a daughter of Zion should act in righteousness. And also for those of the nations who are not Israel, who are not bloodline uh, lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have classes for you available as well. Call Unity, United Nations in the Tabernacle of Shai or the Messiah. Email us about joining that class if you're interested, if you are not of Israel, but you still want the salvation of the new covenant and the spiritual oblations. There is an order to things. The priesthood comes out of Israel, but the nations are saved through Israel and there's salvation for the nations as well. So join us, email us if you're interested in joining any of those classes or go to shekinah.com slash priest application if you're looking to join the apprentice priest pool or the candidate pool to see if you're fit to join the priesthood. And make sure once again, you register for the Feast of Pentecost that's coming up uh, at so-called August 1st. That's gonna be the 50th day of the Feast of Weeks. Uh, and make sure we're supporting with our tithes and free offerings so that all of these classes and all the things that the priesthood is looking to do can continue to move on. And with that being said, we'll close the announcements for today as we proceed into the third week of the Feast of Weeks. And we'll turn over our attention over to Chief Priest Banyala for the remainder of the class. Shalom. Shalom. Again, we are an agrarian people or were a farmer culture taking our husbandry seriously. In antiquity, these seven weeks were all about hitting the fields, plowing, reaping, harvesting, and giving the tithes unto the Heavenly Father. So at the 50th day, the Heavenly Father will bless us. So now it's time to mimic what we did in the past. It's time to adhere to the rules, the statutes and commandments of the Heavenly Father, so that each and every one of us on the 50th day can fully, assuredly, Seek a gift, a blessing from the Heavenly Father. Join me as we talk about the second week and the importance of living waters in the mist. Shalom again. I am Chief Priest Banyala of the House of Wisdom presiding over the Sabbath class today, joined by my reader, Executive Priest Yara Dunn, and Apprentice Priest Samak. Speaking of Apprentice Priest, those brothers who are out there seeking to serve the Most High, go to war with sin, go to war with the principalities, the prince of the power of the air, spiritual wickedness in high places. We have a pool together right now where we are sifting through, trying to find the most powerful, the most credible, the most 
dignified men with stick to itness to join us in that battle. Definitely join us because the world is coming to an end. The curtains are closing on this show. And the Heavenly Father is looking for those who have been performing for the next. The end of this world is good news to us. Because the Heavenly Father once again is about to bring a more benevolent society. A colony of righteousness on the earth. Where we're just not in the land of captors or colonizers rehearsing righteous acts. We're actually fulfilling it on the whole entire planet. Hegemony and righteousness. Let's start off in Deuteronomy 16 verse 9. Uh, apprentice priest A.P. Samak talking about why we do what it is we do. There are some people new to this and there are some people that have been in for quite some time and we're going to, for those who've been in for quite some time, remind you for those who are new to it, educate you. Deuteronomy 16 verse 9. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Now the Heavenly Father gave us a commandment, but with this commandment you must have understanding. He didn't say come at the first month, 24, or 21st day and then do the Feast of Weeks. He says seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. That means that you must have some insight on agriculture. You must hearken back to your agrarian roots. You must become a farmer people. You must become a people that understand the land. But if you're living in a tenement building on the 13th floor in New York City somewhere and you ain't seen corn besides what they give you at the Chinese restaurant, you stuck like Chuck. And you don't know what's going on. But there are those who the Most High is telling us, look, learn the calendrical count. Learn about intercalary days. Learn about the true length of a year. Learn about the two seasons. And he has taught us and he has showed us and he has put it and codified it in his law when to come and do it. It's not enough to just know. Even if those people out there that are searching knew when the day of the Feast of Weeks were to start. If you don't know what to do, it's useless to know the date. It's not a date you get there and you just start singing. The church does that. It ain't a day to get over there and make up something. The Khazars do that. The sons and daughters of the Most High will worship him appropriately in due season and in due time. So we talked about this at length. We've gone through the book of Adam and Eve. We've gone through the Apocrypha. We've gone through the Bible. So I'm going to encapsulate in a very short verse. If you would, give me St. John, Second of Priest Yaradun, 435. Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Ah, say not that there are four months, then come harvest. Where was the Messiah? He was in preparation for the Passover. When is the Passover? First month, 14th day. So he's saying now, don't say 91 days from now, which begins the fourth month, then we can have the Feast of Harvest. He's trying to tell the people, don't be so carnal. I know that that's when the time of the Feast of Harvest, that's what we can extrapolate and glean from this. He was telling us parabolically, deep, dark sayings, when is the Feast of Harvest? From that very first month, 91 days after that begins the fourth month, after the intercalary day. Now he's trying to tell them what? Let's read on. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to He harvest. said, look unto the field. Look at all these people. He wasn't talking about corn. He was talking about the people that needed to be taught, educated, and brought into the covenant of the Most High. He was talking to his disciples. And so what we can once again glean from that is when you start this feast called the Feast of Weeks, it's also called the Feast of Pentecost. It's also called the Feast of Harvest. The very end, the Feast of End Gathering at the year's end. And so if we are acquainted with this Hebrew phraseology, we will understand exactly when it starts. Why are we stressing this point? Because the Khazars, who unfortunately most of our brothers look up to, tells us that we need to start the Feast of Weeks three weeks after the New Year. Three weeks after winter. We've covered it that wheat, corn, all these grains take a minimum 
of 90 days to mature, 90 to 100 days. How is it that in 14 or 21 days, you have full ears of corn to put your sickle to? It's impossible. But see, that will fly on modern day Hebrews because we own no land. And I'm talking about us as a majority. There are some of us that are getting out there now, but we're not acquainted with our agricultural roots. And so you can pull the wool until you actually start owning land or working land. Let me say, because in America you own nothing. Start working that land and know that I cannot, it is impossible to start raising that grain and having it ready uh, uh, right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so the Messiah was telling us that. But now he's telling you that the spiritual harvest stay ready. There are saints already out there that you got to go and teach and educate. And this is what he is imploring each and every one of us do in this time of harvest. Let's read on. Verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Check that out. That's what you're doing in the second week, going into the third week. You're reaping. He sold. You're reaping. You didn't birth your neighbor. You just dare to care for your neighbor, help your neighbor. Some of us are not rich. Most of us are not rich. But there are other forms of capital. I may be rich in great words. I may be rich in knowledge. I may be rich in understanding. But piss poor when it comes to financial monetary sustenance. So what you are rich in, go and give it to those who are poor. Go help your brother in this feast because we are expecting an outcome, a blessing. You know, in the Christian church, they always talk about sow a seed. And they pull out that big old bucket. And that seed means Benjamins and, and all types of dollars. Nobody is talking about a seed being monetary. That seed is adhering to the word of the Most High. You're now sowing that. Go and help your fellow man. Make a conscientious effort today. I'm going out combing them streets. Some of us live in neighborhoods. You don't have to comb the street. You go right outside. There's 12 of them standing right there. Go and help in righteousness. I may not be able to give you $20, brother, because you may go and buy some fentanyl, some crack or some heroin, whatever it may be. And I, I can't have that on my consciousness. But I will take you to the restaurant. I will give you this jacket or give you these shoes or whatever it may be. Give you this room at the hotel. Go and get virtue. You will reap it on the 50th day. You'll see the most High is going to tell you, try me. Just experiment with this. You ain't got to fully believe it. Just try it. You tried a lot of things in your life. And a lot of them didn't work out. Why not try the most high? Let's read on. And gather fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. He that soweth. The Messiah sowed these things. We have to be there to reap. He's coming back to see how much all of us has reaped. How much all of us have harvested. Once again, some of us right now understand that it is the second week going into the third week. And we have done nothing. And we don't plan to do anything. We just actually waiting for this to be over. But there are those who are excited. We are addicted to righteousness. We can't wait to put in work because we got so many things we need to be accomplished. And the only way to get it accomplished is to ask the Heavenly Father. But when you ask the Heavenly Father, you got to be rich in virtue, rich in works. Because that store that the Heavenly Father has don't take green dollars. The currency is virtue. How much you got? How much of it you have? Oh, you got a sick child that needs to be healed? You can't buy that. I mean, you didn't try to spend all your money on the doctors and they can't do anything else. Seek him who can heal, but you got to be rich. Let's read on. And when I mean rich, rich in virtue. I don't want nobody to cut that little piece. All right. Rich in virtue. Read on. Verse 37. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. Check that out. That proverb is true. You don't have to be uh, the farmer that does everything. You just got to come in and do your part. It's time to reap. The harvest out there, he says, is already ready. Don't wait till the Feast of Weeks. You do this all the time, but especially, especially in the Feast of Weeks. The corn is already white. Go out there with your basket and harvest it. There's a lot of work. People don't get it. 
twisted. Do not get lost in translation. These seven weeks is about you going to the flock, going to the people, and beginning to do the will of the Most High. Educate. Elucidate. Indoctrinate. Expand the consciousness in the minds of the people out there. Those who can preach, preach. Those who can teach, teach. Those who can help, heal, or clothe, or feed. You do what you can do. You're going to need this virtue in the near future. Each and every one of us. Let's read. Verse 38. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Check that out. The Most High said, I sent you to reap. That's your job. You need to tell that to yourself. The Most High sent me to harvest. He sent me to work. I didn't birth that guy. That's not my son. That's not my daughter. That's you putting in work. You the sower now. But he's saying you didn't sow. The most I birthed that person, put that person in that predicament for the exact same reason. Because one day, this particular day, you was going to be given the opportunity to help. What you going to do? Forego it, overlook it, you too busy? I don't like the way he or she looks. You may lose out on your ticket, your virtue to receive that gift from the Heavenly Father. Let's read on, priest. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labor. Other men put in work. They sold. They did all of this. This is a joint effort. This is a joint effort. It's like a family business. They pass that on to generation to generation. Woe be he who comes up after 30 generations in family, and the business went bankrupt in your generation. Come on, man. All your ancestors looking like, look at the clowns we let, we, we, we didn't birth. Not on my watch, we all should be saying. We are going to put in work. And so he's telling you now, let's go back to Deuteronomy 16, where you left off. For seven weeks in antiquity in the sixth covenant, we were to put our hands to the plow, put our hand to the sickle, start cutting and offer to the Most High his first fruit. We have already done that. We waved that sheaf. And, and, and started the races. The races were on. And everybody's going out to their vineyard and their little hamlet, their little village to go out and do work because we need it. It's reciprocal. The Heavenly Father requires this of you because he wants to do something for you. Now that you are enlightened, let's make this machine, this mechanism work. Call a chapter in the verse, Apprentice Priest Samach. Deuteronomy 16, verse 10. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Most High thy Abba with a tribute of a free will, free will offering of thy hand, which thou shalt give unto the Most High thy Abba according to the Most High thy Abba have blessed thee. You must, you're required to do two things, love the Most High and love your brethren. How do you love the Most High? I am going to ensure that there are meat offerings going up at headquarters. I'm going to ensure that they have the oil and the frankincense are on point. I'm going to ensure that they have everything they need to offer to Abba an oblation for all of us who are in the covenant. So I'm going to Shekinah.com. I'm going to get my tights and send it in for this week, this month, however you parse it out, but make sure you do it in the feast of week. And he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who give bountifully shall reap a bountiful harvest. And so the Most High is saying, tribute of free will offering of thy hand, and then go and help your brother with the like intensity and have an impact upon their world. And I'm not talking about just your uncle or somebody you know. You know, That's cool. You know, Don't avoid them either. But you need to hit a part of town where you know nobody. Make up some lunches and go out and give it to those who are hungry. They appreciate it. We do that here quite often at the House of Wisdom, and they appreciate it. So it's time for us to realize that this is an accelerator. The most I put us in a little vortex right now. This is like you get three for one. You get three virtue points for one deed. This is the Feast of Weeks. Get it in. Let's continue on, priest. Apprentice priest. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 11. And thou shalt rejoice before the Most High thy Abba, Thou and thou sons and thou daughters and thou manservant and thou maidservant and the Six Levite that is within the gates and the stranger and the fatherless, the fatherless, and the widow 
that are among you in the place which the Most High thy Abba have chosen to, to place his name there. He said wherever the Most High place his name at this at, 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 at in the beginning it was not in the place that we call Jerusalem only post flood did it get moved over to what we now call Israel but before it was at another place now the Heavenly Father is moving at another place it's where he deemed is sufficient for his oblations and peace offerings to come up to him but then he said make sure that you bring into your gates the strangers this doesn't mean an Israelite that you don't know this means the nations who didn't know the Most High you bring them in and you spread the good news amongst them as well and what about the fatherless and what about the widows whose husbands have passed away and what about those who have no fathers no mothers what about those who disenfranchised it's time for you to stand strong with what the Most High has blessed you with and begin to move that out all over the world wherever you can because you know that you should receive it back according to how you have given it out we're going to drop that. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, talking about this second week. It's titled Living Waters. And we're going to get to that water part and show you how it's critically important that we understand how important it is. We should be looking forward to these feasts, particularly this feast of week. Like I said, it is an accelerant for you to get answers in your life. We know we all have pitfalls and hurdles and stumbling blocks in our world. But our creator is called Abba for a reason and once you realize that reason you can now begin to cry to him because he's your father no child goes about and say I don't need my father I'm going to go out here I know I'm only six months but I'm going to go to the grocery store and get me some milk <laughs> you cry loud and you cry loud if you, he, he's not hearing you until he hears you and come in and say oh, let me suckle you oh you just suffer for a moment let me take care of you Let's not give up on our Abba. He has not given up on us. Let's read, priest. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3. 9, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Look at the consequences. In these seven weeks, you who reap are so sparingly. Now, you can do this by omission or commission. You can do this willingly or unwillingly. I didn't know. I mean, I had to work. I ain't have really time for that. It doesn't matter. If you didn't put them seeds in the ground, you're not going to pull anything out of the ground. You make a more conscientious effort to do what the scriptures is saying for these seven weeks. Take care of your brethren. Take care of your people. Go out even to the nations and sow those seeds of righteousness and you will reap virtue. And as I said before, with no jokes, this is a time of accelerant. The most high now, just like the fruit. The fruit don't grow as fast in winter as it does in the summer. It's accelerated because of the radiation, the gamma rays coming from the sun. Same thing with your virtue right now. And what happens after the 50th day? Then come it winter. Like the squirrels and like the animals, stock up. That cold weather is coming. What did that mean? Hard times is coming. And you may be at the hospital bed crying, Abba, please help. Well, well, you remember you had to work double shift in the Feast of Weeks? And I told you to get your virtue? That's the time you go pull out that debit card. That true master card. It masters every situation. But swipe this joint. You coming up out this bed. I know I'm about to deplete my account, but you coming up out this bed. And next feast of week, we're going to get it in. Triple time. Let's read on, priest. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. He that soweth bountifully. And so what this is indicating, each and every one of us got to hit the pavement running. We got to put in work. Don't let Satan come in. The only reason I think a conscientious Hebrew would so sparingly is because the adversary came and made your life so complex. I would, but my car, I would, but my daughter, I would, I just, I would, but I won't. And so you won't get it. 
Let us put in extra work to sow uh, uh, bountifully so that we can reap a bountiful harvest. Let's continue, priest. Verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for our beloved a cheerful giver. The Most High loves someone who loves, engaging in the feast of week, taking care of his neighbor. Love it. Love going out there when you find someone in need. When we go out and feed the homeless, just talking for edification purposes, it's like some of the brothers is fighting each other to get to the brothers. Fighting each other. Hey, I got this one. I got because they love it. Not for vainglory's sake to say I fed more than you. It's just I don't want anybody to take my virtue. And so this is the mindset of the saints in the Feast of Weeks. Let us give to the Most High, making sure that the tights are in due order. And then let us now love our brethren and go and help and take care of them. Whatever you are rich in, as I said from the onset, Everybody don't have money. Everybody is not wealthy or rich in monetary gain. But some of us is rich in knowledge. Go and teach that brother who is piss poor when it comes to knowledge. Some of us have access to a lot of clothes or whatever it may be. You may work at a store to throw clothes away or food away. Go and help what you have a bountiful harvest of. Go help with that. Let's read on. Verse 8. And Abba is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. The Most High says that he, through the seventh covenant graciously given unto you, that you always will have sufficiency of all things. That you may look at it and say it's tight, but you never lacked. You never lacked in bread, you never lacked in clothes, you never lacked in anything. The Most High said, I will take care of you. And I will put you in a situation where you can help others. Always. Let's continue. Verse 9. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown. And increase the fruits of your righteousness. Multiply your seed sown. This is what I'm telling you. It's an accelerant during these times. Your seed will be multiplied. You put in one seed, it creates a corn stalk with many ears on it, with all types of grain on it. This is the time. The Most High says, this is obviously an insertion, but it's right on point. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remain forever. This is about you being written in the history books, you being written in the annals of time, that you observed the Feast of Weeks and you did it with all your heart, mind, and soul. So reap a commensurate blessing. Let's continue. Verse 11. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to our... Check that out. Being enriched with everything, with all bountifulness, which causeth through us a thanksgiving offering to the most high the church will interpret that that means thank you jesus but we in the seventh covenant understand what a thanksgiving offering is it's saying that at the 50th day this helps the ministers give to the heavenly father a peace and thanksgiving offering it is time for us to work in our generation in our sixth millennium it is about fervent work it is about being strong hardened soldiers, putting on the whole armor of the Most High. Having our loins girt about with truth. Having on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace and thanksgiving offering. But above all, with the shield of faith and the sword of the word, slay the enemy. This is the fight. We're engaged in it right now. Some of us want a static war. You can't win that. This spiritual war, you have a chance. It's an evil play, uh, uh, even playing field for everybody who engages in it. Let's read, priest. Verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto Abba. Check out the depths. For the administration of this service not only supply 
the want of everyone who is in the covenant, because that's what a saint is, gather my saints together, those who have made a covenant with me by spiritual sacrifices, by you harvesting. In these seven weeks, the Most High is giving you the spiritual wherewithal to survive, to thrive in the weeks to come, even post after the Feast of Weeks. But abundantly also that we may be stable enough to continue with the thanksgiving offerings unto the Most High. That is the ultimate goal, my brethren. The Most High created us after he created worship. And we're going to cover that today. He created man essentially like the very end. But he created worship in the beginning. That's how important it is to the Heavenly Father. But we, we in our finite, small little thinking chamber, think if I get this together, if I can mow the yard first, you know, if I have a little time left, I'll watch 15 minutes of a video. And you think that that is your due service. You've only cracked the egg. That's it. Put a little, little crack in it. You still got to put it in there, beat it, whip it, fry it, put it with something. There's so much more to do. Let's continue, priest. Verse 13. Walls by the experiment. Check this out. Man. This is amazing to me every time I read this. Read that again. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration. While you are experimenting hmm. with this administration, with these words in this feast of week. I know you don't have to believe. You don't have to believe fully. Just do it. Experiment with it. I'm keeping a journal every day. I went out and fed the homeless on the third of the third week. The fourth week, I went on and did that. The fifth week, I did this. Sixth week, I, let's see what's going to happen on the seventh. This is what the scientists do. They experiment. They don't know what the outcome. They think they know. And they put it down, and boom, poof, there it is. It is what it is. The Most High is telling each and every one of us to become spiritual scientists. Experiment with this. But what happens? We'll see. We put in a week. You put in two weeks. And then you lose interest and move on. No scientist does it that way. You got to see this thing through. And then you reap the benefit. Then you can patent that thing in the scientific world and make money off of it or whatever you make off of it. But in this world right here, the Most High is saying experiment with it. And the end result, when it happens, you now have proof and evidence of the Most High you cannot see called faith. It's time, brothers and sisters. Most High is giving you ample opportunity to step up, stand up, do what's right. And you'll reap the rewards. Let's read on. Actually, well, read that again. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify Abba for your professed subjection unto the gospel of the Messiah, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Because of your liberal distribution, you wasn't a miser. You wasn't hoarding your little gifts. He wasn't trying to put it away. I'm going to retire and live 95 years. He was like, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. My children may take my money and squander it at some club somewhere. Popping bottles with sprinklers on it. Talking about, you know, we doing it up. I'm about to liberally distribute it unto the children of the Most High. Whether they know it or not know it, I'm about to help them out. I'm about to get some virtue. I'm experimenting with this. I want to see what the end going to be. Let's read. Verse 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of Abba in you, thanks be to Abba for his unspeakable gift. Thanks to the Most High for his unspeakable gift of grace, mercy, and charity. We're going to slide over to Acts, the second chapter. Those who have read Acts, the first chapter, you understand that the Messiah returned. And he began to assemble his apostles and told them, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Go and perform in the midst of the Feast of Weeks that they call in the New Testament, Pentecost. And they came together with one accord. And that they were breaking bread and pouring of wine all through the Feast of Seven Weeks, as you'll see in a moment. And the Most High came down upon them and gave them exactly what they were anticipating. A gift. Not just any old ordinary gift. He gave them the gift that they was deficient in. Remember that. 
You got a lot of people talking about speaking in tongue. They know not what they're talking about. We talked about it at length, so I'm not going to go through it in depth. Speaking in tongue, first and foremost, without even talking about speaking in tongue, whatever the gift was, it was because it was a deficiency of it. And so everybody could have been broke leg over there. The most I would have sent out a bunch of legs. <laughs> and so it was a diverse community and all of them spoke different languages. So the most I said, I'm going to give you the ability to communicate and converse with everyone about the gospel. And so you going in your closet talking about Shama Lama Lama, <laughs> it's madness. This is intellectual masturbation, as they say. You're just doing your own stuff to make yourself feel good. You're not receiving a gift from the Heavenly Father. So let's get into Acts 2 and let's show, let's talk about how this was the end of the Feast of Weeks and how they received the gift, but let's focus on what they were doing. Let's read. Acts 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. This is that feast that we spoke about in Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, in the ninth verse. Let's put a little footnote right there. We have men post-Messiah crucifying and rising up, being commanded by the Messiah to go do a Deuteronomy statute law. Isn't that something? Then you got modern Christians say, we don't do that. We don't, but they call themselves the Pentecostal church. But know nothing about the Feast of Weeks. Nothing whatsoever. It's all predicated on speaking gibberish. But we have here for you scholars and those who want to be scholars. Take note. Post-resurrection, the Messiah commanded them in the first chapter to go and wait and perform this mosaic feast in the seventh covenant, you'll see. And wait for the gift. Because this is not a worldly religious thing. This thing is literally etched in nature. You can't change the way the river flows. That's simply what it is. You can believe it goes upstream, but it doesn't. At this time, the heavens open up for seven weeks. And then you can believe what you want to believe, that they, that stuff done away with, but the heavens still open. And those who want to perform like they are doing in heaven, you will reap the benefits. Let's read on. They were all with one accord in one place. They all were in one mindset. The Messiah already equipped them with the new covenant spiritual sacrifice and none deviated from it. They was all within the lots of David, giving up sacrifices, propitiation, oblation, addicted to righteousness. Continue. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And I'll read again in the first verse and when the day of Pentecost was fully come Pentecost meaning 50 so the 50th day was there it was the end then came a rush mighty wind the Ruach Rechach Wadash the Holy Spirit saying I have been released upon you guys and I see the dearth that is amongst you I see what you really really need right now you may want some other stuff but I see what you really need let's read and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Shalakia, the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Once again, this is their reaping of a reward that was promised to them by the Messiah in Acts the first chapter. Just like what we have gone through already, there is a promise, and the most I cannot lie, that at the 50th day, a gift will come to you. As we are discovering here, we don't know what their desires were, but we know that their desire was to please the Heavenly Father, and the Father gave them something that will please Him uh, massively. It is to communicate the seventh covenant to the people. How do you do that? I'm going to give you the ability to have that conversation you speak in one language, and I don't care if he's from Russia or he's from Italy, he's from the Sudan, he's from Somalia, he's from Ethiopia. It don't matter if he's from Lebanon, Mauritania. They all hearing that man speak in their all diverse languages, speaking like a scholar. Read on. Verse 5. And there was dwelling 
at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. All right, jump down to 42. Now, look at what was going on as we read the storyline. These were Jews, devout men out of every nation in a diaspora or in exile spread abroad. Remember, at this point, the Babylonians had already sacked the children of Israel. The Persians had their way. The Greeks came in and Hellenized. Now, the Roman, the Greco-Roman armies were now trying to extinguish the flames of Israel. And so we were running all abroad in the neighboring countries, but we still had an inkling of our Hebrew roots and culture, enough to come back for the Feast of Weeks. And so when we came back, we were speaking the local languages, and after a couple of generations in a foreign land, your children don't know that language, your language anymore. And so the Most High obliged the saints to speak to them in the tongue of the land of their captors. Let's read on. 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So when they communicated these things to them, they communicated these things to them, get uh, Acts 3.9. We're going to come back to um, 2.42. When they communicated these things to these newly arriving saints, what did they do? Read it when you get it. Acts 3 verse 9. Read 319. Repent ye therefore. This is what they were saying in a foreign language. And be converted. Repent, which means change and be converted. Repent don't mean stop doing wickedness. I repented from smoking cigarettes. It doesn't mean that. Repent means to convert. You convert from covenants. Or you convert from that other religion to this covenant of the Most High. And so he was telling them in all of these languages, not Shumalama, Amalama, Lama Lama. They just wasn't speaking weirdness. They was literally articulating a powerful point of the Most High. Repent. Convert. For what reason? Read. That your sins may be blotted out. So that we may snatch those demons off of you and your people and put it on the altar and burn it. Sounds good, brethren? They all agreed and was like, I'm with that. I am with, I am so with that. So much so, I ain't even going back to Italy. I'm not going back to these foreign countries. I'm staying right here with the saints. Now let's jump down to Acts 2.42. He said, repent and be converted so that your sins can be taken away. Sins will be blotted out. Your trespass is gone completely. This is what the new covenant does for us. And this is what we're doing all in the midst of a feast of seven weeks. Read 42 again. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What was the apostles' doctrine that they articulated to them in all of these, in that one language that was translated into all these other languages? What was it? and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers breaking of bread and oblations that's what the most high gave them the gift to communicate to the people at the 50th day i want you to take that bread that meat offering the body of hamashiach the messiah take that bread heave it and wave it take the drink heave it and wave it and you give these oblations to the heavenly father and so now this happened, and as a consequence, the congregation grew. This was a blessing to everyone individually and us as a collective during that time. Let's continue to read. Verse 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So many other signs and wonders. It just wasn't speaking in foreign languages. Many other signs were done. I'm pretty sure they had a deficiency of health. And so the apostles laid hands on the people and healed them. There were people with a plethora of spirits upon them. The apostles laid hands by way of a sin offering and eradicated those evil spirits. This is what we should fully expect if we experiment with this on the 50th day, waiting on the gifts of the Most High to be given to us individually and collectively. Continue, Apprentice Priest. 44. And all that believe were together 
and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they could Once again, the brethren left. They said, we're going to come together. We want to be around you guys. And this is called coming out of the world. I don't want to be isolated on my own island somewhere. I want to be with the brethren. It doesn't make sense to have a billion dollars and being isolated by gates and mansions and acreage and you all by yourself. Rather be rich with my brethren, my family, knowing that we all one accord, praise the Heavenly Father, keep these oblations going until the day of transformation. Continue. And they continually daily with one accord. What does it mean daily with one accord in the temple of the Most High? What were they doing? Read. And breaking bread from house to house. They was breaking that bread from house to house. Once again, this is not talking about mm, this, this colonial bread. Who made this corn bread? It's not that kind of bread. We talking about the flour that brought forth the bread, the cakes that they used for an oblation to the Heavenly Father. And the wine and the oil and the salt and all the other salient things that are needed. But they continued from house to house because there was no central point at that time. Letting you know that you can do these oblations wherever the Most High place his name. And if the Most High place his name upon his priest, we can be next to a garbage can. Ooing garbage juice. It's time to baptize and uh, get this oblation in. You can be in the bowels of prison. Let's get this oblation in. They said lights out in five minutes. It'll only take me four. Get this oblation in. Nothing can separate you from this. This is why it's so critical that you learn it. And once you learn it, keep it. The only way they can take it from you is if they beguile and trick and you give it to them. You believe that that's unnecessary. We don't need to do this. Don't give away the grace that the Most High has given you. Let's finish that, priest did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They ate their meat offering with gladness, one mind and one accord. There was no division amongst them. There was no separation, bifurcation, ideologies and doctrines that was contrary. The Most High gave it to the apostles. They say we will yield to the powers that be. These men are of the Most High. Same thing is happening right now, humbly speaking. The Most High is working with the priesthood. Let us glean, learn as much as we can so that we can reap the harvest. Last verse. Praising Abba and having favor with all people. And the Most High added to the church daily, such as should be saved. The Most High added to the church. Once again, the body, the congregation gained from it. And individually, personally, we gained from it. This is what we are to expect once again. I know I'm harping on the point but it is critically important that we understand that the 50th day comes around it's coming it will happen but how much virtue will you have stored up can you harken back and talk about how many homeless that you have done something to help them with shelter are the naked that you gave clothes are those that were hungry you gave food and drink are those who was late on bills and couldn't pay it that you said hey i'll pay that bill for you and then nothing in return because if you give me something in return, the most I may not give me something in return. This is not a loan. I ain't charging no interest. Take that and pay that. Take care of it. Now I'm gonna see what the most I gonna do on the 50th day. This is the experiment that he's telling each and every one of us to try. He's gonna give us the proof and evidence. We're gonna move from there to Matthew the 13th chapter and we're gonna pick it up in the 18th verse. We are ending the second week of seven weeks and the feast of weeks. And each one of these weeks have a theme to it. Each one of them have a purpose to it. But we're talking about the general points right now that we need to do all through every seven uh, weeks, all of the weeks. And then we're gonna talk about particularly what is germane to this week. And I'll be willing the week to come. Let's read. Matthew chapter 13 verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Check that out. The parable says the sower cometh. That sower is the Messiah. 
and he's putting seeds around and he calls up one of these saints give them comprehension and understanding of the feast of weeks and all the importance of it then come at that wicked one you don't need that man sacrifice done away we don't do those biblical feasts no more brother come on over here we, my church got a great service going on or whatever it may be you just been hoodwinked and beguiled where you don't even remember the points that are precious to your soul this is in the parable analogous to the one who fell by the wayside the wayside was the ground that was not churned up you know just where the corners are or something like that it may happen to catch root and may not 50 50 chance he said don't be those people that just happen to catch this and letting the world come and take you away let's get it pause right there appreciate it done let's get Sirach AP Sirach, Sirach 618 my son gather instruction from thy youth up so shall thou find wisdom to thy old age come unto come unto her as one that plowed the sword ah come unto wisdom all the days of your life you're never too old to learn Come unto her as one that ploweth in the feast of weeks. One that soweth in the feast of weeks. And then what do you do? And wait for her. Wait for the 50th day for what? Good fruits. The good fruit's going to come. It's going to happen. Satan is the one sowing with your seeds doubt. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, come on, brother. Is that another scam they got going or whatever? Let the wheat and the tares grow together. That doubt going to be there. But when the 50th day come, it's like coming in with some uh, herbicide. You pretty much burning up all the weeds that was right there if you stay fervent. Come unto her as one that soweth and ploweth and wait for the 50th day of her good fruits. Read. For thou shalt not toil much in labor about her, but thou shalt eat of her fruits right soon you will eat of her fruit as expected be confident in this and if you're confident are you experimenting this year when it comes again in the winter season you will be more faithful now this will be an important unmovable part of your life because this is the assistance you need to get ahead everybody looking for the next thing this is the best thing this is how we get ahead this is how we sure up our ground is becoming one with our Abba. Continue. She is very unpleasant to the unlearned. What we just read in the parable. If he forget he's unlearned, wisdom will be unpleasant to him. Satan will show you something make that, that looks so good, turn it to be the most evil thing. Make it something that you loathe and hate. She is very unpleasant to the unlearned. Continue. He that is without understanding will not remain with her. He that is without understanding shall be seven weeks. Who worships seven weeks? Man, boy, I'm just going to church and being out with 45 minutes. These knuckleheads doing seven weeks. This is what Satan got you doing. Not knowing this is not something where it's not reciprocal. The Heavenly Father is giving you something for your time. You go to the job and give them more than that. You give them damn near 364 days a year. You ain't complaining. Get a most size seven weeks. And he's going to bless you more than a job could ever bless you or any tangible moral, a mortal person could ever. Read on. She will lie upon him as a mighty stone of trial. And he will cast her from him ere it be long. She will lie upon that doubter that lazy person that one who's by the wayside and she will be wisdom the Holy Spirit will be upon them like a burdensome stone hey I can't wait to get up out of this stuff seventh covenant is not hard he said your burden is hard his burden is light the responsibility of coming in these lots crying out to the Heavenly Father if you love righteousness you at home but to those who love wickedness this right here is an irritant to you because you like being in the dark. You don't love the light. The Most High is showing that we are the children of light. We bask and we thrive in light. 
We get energized and recharged in light. This is the time for the saints who earnestly want to praise, please, honor the Most High to stand up and do it in the Feast of Weeks. Finish that. So rock verse 6, chapter 6, verse 22. For wisdom is according to her name, and she is, not, she is not manifest unto many. Wisdom is according to her name. She is holy. She is the spirit of the most high. And she will not be given to many. Everybody talking about they got the Holy Spirit. You got a spirit. But I doubt if it's holy. The Holy Spirit is about showing you the rod of the most high. Empowering you to stick in to stay in. And offer the most high the things that he requires. This is what we was created for. Why well, complain? That's like you get sick of breathing. I got to breathe 24 hours? Oh, man. I'm going to take a break from breathing. You just go do that. Go take a long one. This is what we was created. This is part of our makeup. We are machines, mechanisms that was created to worship Abba. And if you love it, you love breathing, this is how the saints love worshiping the Heavenly Father. Fresh air to our lungs. It strengthens us. We're going to move over to Matthew 13, 22. Matthew 13, 22, dealing with this second week in the Feast of Weeks. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Now this is another kind, a character, that we have in this Feast of Weeks. He received the words, and thorns... Is he, he that received the uh, seed amongst thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of the world. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, whether it be your job, whether it be whatever, the excesses of the world, the pleasures of the world, whatever your responsibility. Remember what we read in the beginning? Pharaoh said, kill them near guards. Kill every last one of them. And in, in, in process of killing them, you give them straw. You give them, make mortar without straw. Make their life hard, rigor, and put taskmasters on, uh, over them. And so imagine Pharaoh put that on them, and they turn around and say, I can't come and worship you, Abba, because Fa Heavenly Father knows, Pharaoh, what he's doing. Even in the midst of a taskmaster on top of you, you guys, I'm still coming to the most high. You got to be like Moses and Aaron and Miriam. We're going to sacrifice secretly. I don't care. We got off 12 o'clock in the morning. Well, we'd be oblating to 3 o'clock then. And we get a couple, we get some rest. This is what we have to do. Not let the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke, strangle you of your lifeline. We have to, if you're looking to thrive, if you're looking for that high benchmark, and you're looking to accomplish and win this race, you're going to have to fight in turbulent times. Revelation 7, when they looked at the saints who came out, who was top-notch, they said, who are these guys? These are they who came out of great tribulation. These are they who came out of hell and high water. These are those who didn't have it easy. This walk is not easy. But we must walk. We're going to move over. Wisdom of Solomon 7.22, if you are maintaining that Matthew 13. Wisdom of Solomon, Apocrypha, 722 about the cares of this world for wisdom which is the worker of all things taught me for in her is an understanding spirit holy one only check that out Solomon is saying this he's professing I didn't learn this through any kind of collegiate university I didn't go to seminary I don't have a PhD a doctrine of divinity who taught me? The Holy Spirit came in my chamber of imagery and began to be conversant with me and showing me, leading me in the ways of righteousness, leading me in the ways that was good. And when she came within, gave him an understanding spirit. We just read in Matthew that the understanding was gone from the person and then Satan exploited that. Wisdom gave Solomon an understanding spirit. One only, meaning hero Israel, the most high is one. But then he turned around and says many fold or diverse. Even though the most high is one, he blessed us with many different gifts. He's not just a one trick pony. They can just speak in tongues, that's it. 
Most High can do and will do and have done everything, anything we need. So he's also diverse. Read it from that point. Subtle. Very subtle. The Heavenly Father is doing things people are unaware. Like right now, he's subtle in the prophecies. People think the prophets, the prophecy is going to happen where people coming out of the sky with robes and long beards and white robes and making commandments. That ain't happening. The kingdom of heaven coming not by observation. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is happening right now in our chamber of imagery. We are enacting what is happening in heaven right here on earth. And those who are wise, they see it. They are happy that the Most High is now requiring his oblations in a new covenant. Read it from that point. Lively. The Most High is lively. He's about life, growth. He's about closeness. Separation from the Most High is death, but closeness to the Most High is lively. And so those who stay active in this feast are alive. Read on. Clear. The Most High is not ambiguous. The Most High is clear, straightforward. All the complications in dark gray realms come from Hasatan. You got brothers think that the tassels are the fringes. But then they turn around and say, just in case it's not, that's where the long stringy things too. Most high is clear. It's one or the other, brother. Or it's none of those two. Which one it is? Don't hedge your bet. The most high is clear and precise like it's written in the seventh covenant. No one can argue. Well, they may argue, but you're not entitled to your own facts. The facts are the facts. The Most High has required a seventh covenant preceding the covenant of Moses. And in that covenant is a chronicle of things that we must do. And we're talking about it. We must engage in the Feast of Weeks according to the new covenant in his spiritual sacrifices. Let's read on. Undefiled, plain, not subject to hurt, loving the thing that is good, quick, which cannot be let it ready to do good all those are self-explanatory i will harp upon cannot be led it which means cannot be led astray you're not that one just with any old you know we suffer that in antiquity with eve talking to the adversary what we can eat of the fruit of good and the tree of good and evil hush your mouth satan what what, what you talking about okay, come, come on speak on speak on instead of saying i don't have nothing to say to you as a matter of fact, let me get Adam on the horn. This man over here need to talk to you. I'm out. That's how it should have been. We're not led astray. I'm not talking to anybody who's uh, ambivalent against the truth, antithetical to righteousness. I ain't got nothing to say to him. Cannot be led astray, ready to do good to the people so that good may come to you. Read the 23rd verse. Kind to man. This is what we do in the feast. The Proverbs tell you that a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. How are you going to get that kind answer if there's no man coming to you hard and harsh? The Most High sent him hard and harsh to see what you're going to do. But if you draw a line in the sand, if you talk about my mother, or if you talk about my child, then that's when I unleash fire upon you. You ain't ready. He can say, she can say, whatever. You know what I'm coming back with every time? A soft answer. A soft answer. I'm trying to arrest her wrath. So you're kind to men. You may open the door in this feast of weeks. Come on in, sir. You may say hello when you normally wouldn't say hello. You know that you are acquiescing to the Proverbs of the Heavenly Father. You got the knowledge, understanding, discretion, equity, justice, judgment. Then at the 50th day, you get this accelerated virtue. Let's read steadfast you steadfast firm you ain't letting nobody take you off this mound continue sure you are confident in what you do read free from care you are free from care that's why i want to pause on free from care mean carefree you're not entangled with the wickedness of this world i know they told me i gotta do that dot 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 but it's the feast of weeks it's the feast of weeks so I'm going to have to take some time away to do what, my, what the Heavenly Father commands me to do. Let us be free from the cares of this world. Not meaning forget it. Not mean do away with them. It's just we got to manage them. Let's continue. Having all, having all power, overseeing all things, and going through all understanding, pure and most subtle 
spirits. For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passed and go through all things by reasons of her pureness. All right, it's time for us to have a pure heart, being holy. It's time for us to be most subtle, meaning don't go out and tell people you're doing proverbs. I'm, I'm going to use a proverb on you, brother. <laughs> proverbs says soft answers. I'm going to give a soft. You, you're not subtle now. You're not subtle at all. All right, you get no virtue for that. All right, so we have to be subtle. That is the environment that wisdom grow in. All right, you get that gift from the Heavenly Father and from no one else. And then this talks about our spirit. We meet, need to control it because wisdom is more moving than any motion. Wisdom is not stagnant. And if you're stagnant, then you ain't rocking with wisdom. If you're doing the same old, same old that you did before you came into covenant, wisdom ain't seen you. If you're rocking with wisdom, you always flowing. you diverse. You're moving around. You're learning new things. You're growing, re, uh, achieving new heights and new goals. And one of the new goals is I knew not about the Feast of Weeks. Now I'm not going to be stagnant in this Feast of Weeks. I'm going to get my tights so the oblations can go. And then I'm also going out here head hunting and righteousness for my brother that is in need of something that I have. Now I may meet somebody that say my rent is doing this $3,500. I can't help you on that, brother. If you're poor, I'll move right along. I can't get that. That's a big gift that I, I can't. Let me move on. I see this brother over here. I see this sister over here. I can help. You can't help. Every situation is not for you. That's for that next brother. But work it so that you are not entangled in this world so that you can observe the opportunity when it comes in the midst of you. Let's read 2 Peter 2.20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yahweh the Messiah, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Once you learn about this seventh covenant, when you learn about the high holy days, particularly right now, the Feast of Weeks, this is the scope of what we're talking about. And then you are entangled in the ways of the world that you abdicate your responsibility, your duty to the Heavenly Father so that you can please your sergeants and generals and captain and taskmasters in the world, it says better for you not to even have heard this than to wax worse and slack and backslide and doing the work of the Heavenly Father. Every man, woman is accountable for their own soul salvation. Yes, you can give your tights. Yes, you can give those oblations. That's a good start. But there's something close right behind that. It's loving your brethren. You must go out. Nobody can force you to do that. You have to want to do that. You have to want to go out and do that knowing that there is reciprocity at the end. Let's continue on, priest. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So it is like the age old parable. A dog ate some trash. The stomach say, get this crap out of us. And he up chuck it on the ground. And he forget that that thing was in his stomach before. Go smell it. Smell like food. And chomp it down again. This is what we do. We forgot that the world was evil. And the Most High delivered us out of it. And we began to complain about his grace, mercy, and charity. How it's too complex or too arduous or whatever it may be. And then we return to the darkness of the world. It was better for you not to have known this. Than to do spite to what the Most High has graciously given you. You know, we say this quite often because it's so meaningful, so true. How do you feel... If you'd have served in the kitchen and made this delicate plate, you know, it's, it's, it was work. It, was, it cost you a lot of money. And you went out to a homeless man under a bridge and said he hadn't eaten three days. You give it to him. He's like, I don't want that. And chuck that plate like a Frisbee. You like, you ungrateful, dirty moron. Hmm. I feel like laying hands. That's not how we should think. But think how the most I think when he gave you. All of this grace, mercy, and charity. And we do spite to him. 
He says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who do spite to this grace, mercy, and charity given unto us in the latter day. So, let us not be those who get entangled. Go back to Matthew 13, picking it up in 23. Let's not be those who receive the word and get so caught up in the ways of the world that we forget what the Most High gave us. And by default, we start preparing to fulfill the will of the world because we feel that it is our duty. We got to do it. Let's read. Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let us be those whose seed fell on the good ground in this feast of weeks, this agrarian feast of harvest, where we who don't have fields anymore, don't have our land, we're in exile, we still can lay, break up our fallow ground, plant seeds of righteousness in these last days and begin to see our fruit be received by the Heavenly Father and we receive a gift commensurate to the work that we have done. This is deep. This is the insight of the saints in the latter days. This is what we must do. It doesn't repudiate or repulse the saints to do these things. A true saint right now is thinking like, I can do that. I can do that. And you're preparing. You want to hit a rest. What I need to do to complete this? The 50th day come around. I want to have my camera ready. See how the most I going to bless me. He may bless you before the 50th day too. Let's continue to read on. Verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the house of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat in my barn. Another parable he put forth and said. So now he's saying clearly here, that in this feast of weeks, you are going to see the tares, the weeds grow up. You're going to see them ready to entangle and snare you. That's the problems. That's the work. That's the obligations that you have in the world. He said, should we try to get them up? No, you may kill my saints as well. He told the angels, back off. Let them grow together. But when they start bearing fruit, then we're going to harvest the fruit and then we're going to bind up all the problems, all the satans, and we're going to burn them on the 50th day. That's the time of harvest. So all your problems, note them. All your problems, bind them together like the chaff. And let us wait for the burning, the consumption that happened on the 50th day. The Most High is graciously telling you, I am here to make your life a lot more simpler. Discipline yourself. Dedicate yourself. Be of pure heart. Don't be led it or led astray. Have some stick to itness. Be in the covenant. Love the Most High at all times. Let's jump down to the 34th verse, priest. All these things spake Yahweh unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. He said he will utter things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world since Genesis 1. And we're going to get to Genesis 1 in a moment, but let's break down that parable. Read on. Continue. In Tobit 2. Verse 36. Then Yahweh sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parables of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, 
He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. So hearkening back to the parable, he said, he that soweth the seed, that's me, the Messiah. I'm the one teaching. I'm the one showing you all of these mysteries that have hid for so long. I'm showing you what the most high one of you. Continue. Verse 38. The field is the world. The field is the entire world, your neighborhood. It is people outside, abroad. Continue. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The good seed are all the saints in the world receiving messages from the Messiah. Continue. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The tares are the children of the wicked. So while you are in the feast, the tares is like, don't do it. Come to work. As a matter of fact, we need some double time. Everybody is commanded to come in. Or you get fired. Turn around, your car needs this. Your rent's going up. Your mortgage, whatever it may be. All types of stuff. These are the tares. Chastening you. Challenging you. All through the feast of weeks. Continue. Verse 39. The enemy that sold them is the devil. He said an enemy did this. Who did this? Satan did this. That adversary to Israel. He is the one making all things problematic. He is right there knowing exactly what he's doing. We have to overcome Hasatan. And we know how to overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. We have to stay more resolved, more resistant, so that we can reap what it is we have to reap. He know what he's doing. Remember, the chaff is getting burnt. But if you ain't produce anything, you getting burnt. He knows that a resilient, strong congregation is going to cause him and all of his constituency, all of his little evil minions to be burned on the altar of the Most High. And let's oblige him on that. Let's do exactly what the Most High prescribed for him to burn him. Read on. Verse 39. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. The harvest is as we get closer to the end of this millennium and the beginning of the seventh at hand and the reapers are the angels coming to redeem his saints. Let us put in good work, people. Let us always put in good work. We're going to transition now and go to Tobit, the second chapter, in the Apocrypha, and we're going to pick it up how Tobit himself engaged in this glorious feast, sometimes called Pentecost, sometimes called the Feast of Harvest, Sometimes toward the end called in gathering, but it's the feast of weeks of the most high. Let's read. Now, when I was come home again, and my wife Anna was restored unto me with my son Tobias, in the feast of Pentecost, which is the holy feast of, of, of the seven weeks, there was a good dinner prepared for me, and the which I sat down to eat. So we have Tobit and his son Tobias and his wife Anna of the northern captivity in the captivity of the Assyrians the Assyrians was coming down upon them with rigor let's look how hard they was coming down on them and let's contrast your life to Tobit and Tobiah's life let's read and when I saw abundance of meat I said unto my son go and bring what poor man soever thou shalt find out of our brethren who is mindful of the most high and lo I tarry for thee. All right. He said, man, we got so much food right here, man. Let's get some virtue. Go out to one of our countrymen. Let us feed them that are hungry. You got some clothes? Let us give some clothes to those who are naked. Let us help them out. Even though that we're in exile, even though we're being oppressed by the Assyrians right now. This is the mindset each and every one of us should have in this midst of the Feast of Weeks. Continue. But he came again and said, Father, one of our nation is strangled and is cast out in the mark marketplace. Father, one of our countrymen has been strangled and he's laying dead in the street. And there is a mandate from the Assyrians not to touch the dead body when they throw it out there. Let him rot and disintegrate. Let flies and dogs eat his meat from off his bones don't go and touch him is the mandate let's read then before i had taste of any meat i started up and took him up into a room until the until the going down of the sun he said i ain't even touched that fool 
My people are suffering, I'm suffering. And to hell with the mandate, don't touch a brother. Because I know the Levitical statutes. I know the law. The law is, if you see your brother out there and he died, you got to bury him before the sun go down. You got to put him in the grave. So am I going to let my fear toward my enemy, my captors, prevent me from doing the will of the Most High? Let's change it up a little bit. I'm going to let my job stop me from engaging the feast of the Most High? Let's change it up a little bit. I'm going to let my spouse stop me from doing the feast of the Most High? What you going to do? What you going to let separate you from the love of the Most High? Tribulation? Suffering? A vile, abominable, dark society? Nothing. We're more than conquerors. We're more than victors. This will happen because it's prophesied we will do it and we will reap the benefit. Tobit was like, I don't care. If they kill me and lay me in the street, I die filled with virtue. Let's read. Then I returned and washed myself and I ate my meat in heaviness, remembering that prophecy of Amos as he said, your feasts shall be turned into mourning and all your mirth into limitations. Therefore, I weep. And after the going down of the sun, I went and made a grave and buried him. But my neighbors marked me and said, this man is not yet af afraid to be put to death for this matter, who fled away and yet, lo, he buried the dead again. He said, you, the neighbors looked at him and said, you still, you, you tripping. You tripping, bro. We let you slide the first time you start burying people. But you at it again, mocking him. You ain't afraid to die, are you? Essentially, he was like, nah, I'm not doing this for vain glory. I'm doing this because the Most High mandated us to do these things. You have retracted from your obligation with the Heavenly Father, but we keep it the law, statutes, and commandments. Me and my son, my wife, our household, we will serve the Most High. Let's continue. The same night also, I returned from the burial and slept by the wall of my courtyard. All right, we're gonna stop there and move over to Galatians 6. And we all know who have read the story that he reaped a bountiful harvest. His son now was married who had no options before producing children and greatness family united it was wonderful his works paid off tremendously like your works will pay off tremendously as well look at the past look at our history is there anyone that the most high has ever forsaken is there anyone that ever went gangster gung-ho for the most high and just was out most i was like i forgot about you none Everybody that dedicated themselves to the Most High, the Most High saw it, observed it, and gave them a blessing. And he has not changed. Galatians 6, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, Abba is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't let Satan, the deceiver, creep into your world and beguile you. Whatever seeds you put in in the midst of this feast of seven weeks is what you're going to harvest in the 50th day. Sparingly, you're going to get a little couple of morsels. Nothing, you're going to get nothing. But you put in a lot, you shall receive a bountiful harvest. But I guarantee you, them brothers and sisters who put in nothing going to be like, man, this stuff don't work. This stuff do not work. I'm talking about. It works. You just didn't put in anything. Use the one that was over-occupied with your personal business, and that was just it. But there are those who will keep the faith and receive faith from the Heavenly Father. Read on. Verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So if for this seven weeks you are engaged in things that are pleasing to the flesh, those things that are carnally pleasing to you, once again, jobs are on, they're okay. You got to do it, got to do it, got to work. But they shouldn't be consuming of every moment of your time. People who are engaged in carnality, all, oh, you just fill in the blanks. If that's what you engaged in heavenly for the majority of the Feast of Weeks, then don't be surprised when you get a carnal burger at the end, a nothing burger. Nothing at the very end. Continue. But he that soweth to the Spirit 
shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So those who engage in carnality, you're going to reap carnality. More problems, more complexities, more sicknesses. But those who sow to the spirit shall reap, 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 reap things that appertain to everlasting eternal life. And that runs the gambit. It's any and everything you need in your world so that you can get closer to Abba. Some of us are lonely and we need a spouse. The Most High can give it. Some of us are suffering financially. Le legitimately, the Most High will give it. Some of us with health issues, the Most High will give it. Whatever you have a deficiency of that's been an impediment from you worshiping the Heavenly Father, now's the time to put in work and ask that the Most High give you the best gift that you need to get closer to him. Let's finish that up, priest. Verse 9. And let us not be wary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. When we have the opportunity, let us do good to all men. But let us not neglect those of the household of faith first. And then we do those out there and abroad. So this Feast of Weeks is all about us being farmer, farmer culture, farmer people, agrarians. We used to put our hands in the soil, turn that dirt, and bring that corn, that grain, that fruit, the vegetables to the priests, and they would heave it, wave it to the Most High, and we would be blessed for it. Now that we are in the Seventh Covenant, and we're forbade from doing those things, particularly because we don't have those things, the Most High graciously said, you now, bring the fruit of your lips, the fruit of your deeds and actions, and watch how he accelerated as well on the 50th day. Let's now move over, get Genesis 1-1, priest, you ever done? And talk about how the seven weeks of the Feast of Weeks is parabolically conjoined, intertwined with the understanding of the seven phases of creation. Everything is about worship the Heavenly Father. Worshiping the Heavenly Father is once again at core of why we was created. Everything else has become a distraction. Everything else is supposed to support us worshiping the Heavenly Father. And everything on this earth was created as part and parcel of the worship of the Heavenly Father. But we have taken the Most High's material, we have taken His earthly possessions and we have made an ulterior world that's totally absent from worshiping the heavenly father and that's coming to an end so let's talk about how the seven days or the seven phases of creation intertwine with the seven weeks of the feast of unleavened uh, the feast of unleavened bread i mean uh the feast of weeks let's read genesis 1 verse 1 in the beginning give me jeremiah 4 22 Sama in the beginning, God had created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, not the Most High. Elohim is the Godhead. If you'll give me that in uh, Romans, the first chapter. In the beginning, Elohim, the Godhead, the Most High was already here. You're not going to write a story about the Most High, his, his beginning. It don't work that way. The Most High was here before the author of this book. All right, just simple as that. So you're not going to write a book. In the beginning, there was nothing. Well, what was the most high? <laughs> you're going to write your story after the most high, okay? That's what it is. The most high gave you understanding that at this point, he created the angelic Godhead, Elohim. This is the Messiah, the word, and the innumerable, incalculable angels that is with him. All right? You got that in Romans 1? We now have here, I want to read it correctly so that we'll all understand. And uh, while we're here, the Most High is showing us that we need to have our own version of Torah, what they call Torah and Tanakh, the Holy Bible. And so we're in the process right now of translating this exact same thing in our own Bible to bring to the people. All right? You got it? Where? All right, let's start at um, Romans 1 20. and pick it up at the uh, 18th verse, actually. For the wrath of Abba is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. A time men. will come when the Most High will begin to unleash his wrath upon the earth. 
And so it is high time for each and every one of us to assuage the wrath of the Heavenly Father by doing His will. That's all He wants. Do the will. This is the reason you was created. Any one of us get a vehicle or get a machine, get a TV that don't work. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to just keep the thing? The moment you get a chance, you're going to chuck it, get rid of it, trade it in or whatever. What if we the people of the Most High and we don't work? As soon as the Most High get an opportunity, he's trading you in. Let's read on. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of Abba is manifested in them, for Abba has shown it unto them. The Most High is now showing it unto us. When he show you the truth, you have an obligation now to do truth. You could walk away. You could be the unprofitable seed that got choked. There's consequences. Read on. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Check this out. The invisible things of the Most High. Meaning it was not carnal, it was not tangible. From the creation of the world, Genesis 1, read, are clearly seen. Are now clearly seen. The Most High said, let there be light, we see the light. Let there be water, we see the water. But there was a time when it wasn't even here. Read. Being understood by the things that are, that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. What did the Most High say? In the sixth day, let us make man in our image. So the things that were made now comprehend and see all the creation of the Most High, including what? And Godhead. His eternal Godhead. This is what was making the heaven and the earth. The Most High was speaking it. And they, like a massive army, was going and creating it. And they would turn around to Abba, is this good? And he was like, it's good. Let's move on to the next point. Let's go back to Genesis 1. Read Genesis 1 and 1 again, and you hold Jeremiah 4.22, A.P. Smock. In the beginning, the Godhead created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Abba moved upon the face of the waters. A layperson will see this and say that the earth was like this molten lava, a glob just hanging into space somewhere. It was without form and it was void. And that would be completely and utterly wrong. Once again, not knowing the Hebrew nature, not knowing the phraseology used. Many saints who understood this used this as it appertained to the children of Israel. And we'll grab it real quick. One of the many verses in Jeremiah 4.22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are shottish children and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Jeremiah proclaimed that my people is foolish and they have not known Abba. They are drunkards, drunk in all types of philosophy. They're sadist children, and they have zero understanding. And now when he deduced that the children of Israel have all backslided, gone away, they're in all types of idolatry, but the Most High they will not worship, what was the state and the condition of the earth? 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. So when there's nothing to worship, Abba, the earth is without form. It is void. It is incomplete. And he beheld the heavens, and they had no light of the first day. This light is information chronicled and codified by the Heavenly Father of what pleases him. So let's go read Genesis 1 and 1 again with comprehension and understanding. In the beginning... Abba, the Godhead, created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Most High moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning, the Most High told the Godhead to create heaven and earth. And they created it. But there was no man on the earth. Because man wasn't to be made to the sixth day. Therefore, it was incomplete. The Most High is making everything man will need to worship him chronologically. And so it was without form and void in darkness, meaning the lack of knowing what the Most High want was covering the earth. And then what did the Most High say? Verse 3. And the Most High said, 
Let there be light. And there was light. See, there's a difference here. The Most High would come later in the fourth phase day and say he created the sun, moon, and the stars. So if the sun, moon, and stars were not created yet, what is this light that the Most High is now shining in his new creation? Let's get Proverbs 6.23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproof of instructions are the way of light. The Most High told the angelic Godhead exactly in a book what he want on this earth to produce worship. All right? The light is the lamp, the law, Torah, sacrifice. Instructions and reproof. He began to show them on the second phase, I want you to create the water. The third, come with the vegetation. And the fourth, you're going to come with the times of worship. And the fifth, you're going to separate the waters and the land. And the sixth, you're going to make man. And on the seventh, you're going to come here and worship me. Y'all got it? Kabish? Got it? Okay. Shalom. And they went out and started building it one phase at a time. And they would come back to Abba. Is it good? It's good. Come back again. The next one is good. So the Most High is creating worship on the earth. Let's see where he's going with the second day. If we go back to Genesis. Remember, the light is the book of light, life, where the Most High is telling the angelic Godhead what he needs to be created on this earth for man to come to utilize in the worship of Abba. Let's read. Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. You know what? Let's jump down to the uh, sixth verse. And Abba said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Abba made the firmament, and the Godhead made the firmament, and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And Abba called the firmament heaven, in the evening and the morning were the second day. So now on the first day, he created a, essentially a book. Essentially, symbol together to show what need to be done to create worship, like Torah sacrifice in this creation of his. And so the very first thing they began to build is separating the waters in heaven that they had already built and separating the waters in the earth. Why? Because water is an inseparable part of the worship of Abba. And we who are in the seventh covenant understand that in this second phase, like in the second week, we focus on the water. Everybody who use agriculture, you're not going to be doing it long without water. Right? These fields will not grow if you do not hydrate them properly. But we're going to get into what we should be focused on in the second week. So the Most High separated the waters in heaven. Why did he separate the waters in earth? Because whatever they do in heaven, you have the material to do it here on earth. Letting you know that there is a form of water. Remember, water come in different types of forms. You can freeze it, turn to ice, it can turn to a gas. It can turn to other elements that we know nothing of when it goes to the, element, the, the heavens of the Heavenly Father. Let's get it in 2nd Ezra 6, Apocrypha 41, A.P. Samach. Upon the second day, thou madest the spirit of the firmament and commanded it to part asunder and to make a division between the waters that the one part might go up and the other remain beneath. 42. So now we see that the Most High, again, as stated in Genesis, the first chapter, there was waters that went to the heavens where the angelic Godhead is, and there was waters that came down to the earth where man was to be created. But man wasn't created yet, so the earth still is void and without form, without completion. For time's sake, we're going to jump down to the 47th verse. Upon the fifth day thou saidest unto the seventh part, where the waters are gathered, that it should bring forth living creatures, fowls, and fishes. And so it came to pass. So one of the principal points of that water was baptism. We're going to cover that in a moment. But another was so that living things can come out of it. When you use that water, things that were not, essentially things that were dead, can come alive out of that water. Let's read it. For the dumb water. For the dumb waters. And not I, meaning unintelligent. We're talking about could not speak. 
The dumb water that could not speak. Read it again. The dumb water and without life. Meaning no life in it. All right. There was nothing in it yet. All right. So he's saying without the life. Read on. Brought forth living things. That water became living. That water brought forth living things. We now see the genesis of living waters. That water, that seemingly benign nothing, can make things come alive at the behest of the Heavenly Father. It happened before. And he's going to do it again. It's critically important that we understand when the Messiah began to use this term, living waters. He's harking all the way back to Genesis. There were people who are dumb. There are some people who are dead with no life. That if you sprinkle this water upon them, like it was in the fifth day, they're going to spring to life. They're coming back alive per the mandate prophecies of the Heavenly Father. So, keeping everything in line, the Most High in the second week created the water just for that. To begin to bring these dead seeds back to life. So that we can begin to focus on a regeneration, a resurrection, a getting closer to Abba again. Let's look at what the Father loves doing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, if you will. Executive priest, you already done? 1 Corinthians 1.26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But Abba had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And Abba had chosen the weak things of the world to confound things which are mighty. So the scriptures are saying that you don't see many presidential candidates and prime ministers and you don't see a whole plethora of celebrities and, and, and doctors and PhDs and all of that in that old camp. And you don't see it in the congregation today because it is the most high who teacheth and the most high is choosing the weak things of the world so that he can confound, condemn and smash those things that are great. And who is weaker than the saints in these latter days who are in exile and have nothing who completely robbed of everything let's read verse 28 and base things of the world and things which are despised have Abba chosen the most I have chosen the base thing the remedial the perfunctory type people of this earth the people who have been called by words and and all manner of disparaging terms most i said i'll take that you building a, a a basketball team most i is dealing with a bunch of midgets everybody else is eight feet tall most i said i'll take everybody who's short everybody i'm gonna show you it's not about height and it's not about skill just throw the ball in the air and you're gonna see that ball make left turns right angles Throwing the ball up and it's making right angles. It's going all in the audience and coming back and going straight in the goal or whatever it is. The Most High is telling you he's going to use those people who totally are outcast, unexpected to win. All bets are against them and he's going to win. Read on. Yea, and things which are not. Check out this. Read this slow. He's going to take like it was in Genesis 1 when there was nothing. The most high out of the water, there was nothing. And he commanded the Godhead, make me something. Come on now. That's like Nebuchadnezzar asking Daniel, I don't know what I dreamed. But tell me what I dreamt. What? Give me a clue. Give me say, you're going to die if you don't give it to me. He from nothing told Nebuchadnezzar everything. Like the Most High took from nothing and made water. Took from nothing and made land. Took from nothing and made light, the sun, moon, and the stars. So the Most High said, I did this in the beginning. I'm going to do it again in the end. You're not going to have a country. You're not going to have wealth, prominence, title, stature, nothing. But I'm going to take you and I'm going to make you a mighty people. Read that again, priest. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 28. <clears throat> 
and base things of the world and things which are despised have Abba chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. People that are nothing will bring to nothing the people that are everything. The Most High is working with what they call the underdog. And the underdogs we are. And the Most High will win. The end of this movie, we win. We win. It's going to be tough going, a long road, winding road, but we have to endure to the end. The Most High has promised us victory. Read on. That no flesh of glory in his presence. Now, all these midgets, or short people, I guess i got to be politically correct, uh, can't turn around and talk about how bad we are. How I threw that ball and it took a right angle through the crowd. You ain't, don't, don't, don't boast. You know that's not you. You couldn't put a, a ball in a, in, a, in a soup bowl, let alone throwing it across the court. The Most High is doing all of this in these latter days. All this knowledge, all this wisdom, all this understanding is coming from the Heavenly Father. The congregation come together because the Most High has authorized it. We're going to slide over to Romans, the fourth chapter. And pick it up in the 17th verse, A.P. Samach. And it is, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom it... Continue. Before him who he believed, even Abba, who quickened the dead, and called those things which is not as though they were. The Most High told Abraham exactly. I sacrifice your son and I'll bring him who is dead back to life. But the Most High is telling you, he works with the impossible. And from nothing, he can bring forth something. The thing that was nothing, he bring it to make it everything. We're going to slide over to St. John 4. So this is how Genesis 1 was in the beginning, dealing with the second day. From nothing, he commanded the Godhead to make water and separate it, divide it. One water in heaven and another in earth. Why? There will be worship in heaven and there will be worship in earth. And out of that water in earth shall come. Out of the dumb water that has nothing living in it shall come forth great abundance of life. And any time the children of Israel or this world become void, go tap that water again. I'll repopulate it. Once it become without form, go use that water again. And I'll bring life into that barren land. I will bring sustenance and quench the thirst of everybody who thirsts for righteousness. Let's get St. John 4, verse 5. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Joseph's, now Jacob's well was there. Yahushua, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Yahweh saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. How shall I answer and send to her, if thou knewest the gift of Abba, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Ah, you would have, if you understood who it is that is standing right here before you, the Messiah, the Prince, he who will consecrate David's covenant, you would have gave me water to drink, and I would have gave you the gift of living water. Meaning the water of Genesis, the first chapter, that was dumb and without life, the Most High Command, make things alive with it. He would have baptized her and brought her closer to the Most High, is what he's conveying to her. Read on. Verse 11. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and, thou, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? So she's still being carnal, saying, you don't even have a bucket. We can no rope, nothing. How are you planning on getting living water, sir? Read on. Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Now this woman is posturing as the northern kingdom, not knowing that they had already, well, she's well aware of it, but they had already been taken out. And so she was an imposter trying to act like she was of the northern kingdom. So she said, are you greater than our father Jacob? Let's read. 
which gave us the well and drink thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Yahweh shall answer and say unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Yahweh shall came back and explained. The Messiah said, if you drink carnal water, I'm not talking about carnal water. If you drink that carnal water, you're going to thirst again. Read on. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The water that I give you, you will never thirst again. You will never desire again. It will be an everlasting spring of water that will constantly quench your thirst. What was he talking about? Let's slide over to Matthew 6, 5th uh, uh, chapter in the 6th verse, A.P. Samach. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Ah, now he's making it clear. Continuing on in Matthew, blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Once you drink this water and you get close to the Heavenly Father, you'll never be thirsty for the Most High ever again. You will always be intertwined and interconnected with the Heavenly Father. Read. For they shall be filled. They shall be united and connected with Abba. So he's talking about this spiritual baptism. Bringing you into the seventh covenant. Always utilizing that water. All through the feast and all through the year. All of your time sojourning here until the conversion happened. We're going to drop that and go to Jeremiah. Second chapter. And pick it up in the twelfth verse. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Most High came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus said... Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Most High. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water once again that Hebrew phraseology being spoken the most I said you have forsaken the fountains of living waters the Abba the creator of all things that created uh, the heavens and earth in Genesis and the waters and brought living things out of it. And you have sold yourself for naught and got broken cisterns, have got into religiosity that has nothing to do with you. You has forsaken the true and living power. And as a consequence, what has come upon the, uh, the children of Israel? Verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Israel is a servant. He's a homeborn slave to sin. He is utterly, completely decimated and destroyed. We're going to slide over to Amos, the 8th chapter and 11th verse. The Heavenly Father is saying two things we have done. We have forsaken Abba and we have incorporated ourselves with false gods. This is the crux, the beginning, the middle, and the end of Israel. And so we are now in the midst of abandoning those idols and all of the things that we have learned in this moment of exile and wholeheartedly coming back to our Abba acquiescing and surrendering ourselves unto his will the earth is now not void it is not without form because man again is utilizing the material of the earth to worship Abba Amos 8 verse 11 behold the days come saith the most high that I was seeing a fam famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Most High. So he said, Behold, I will send a dearth, a famine in the land, not of bread and not of water, but this famine shall be of hearing the word of the Most High. He's letting you know what the water is. The water is the word of the Most High. This is what the famine is going to be. And exactly what happened when the children of Israel did those two things to the Most High, he began to extract his prophets. He began to slowly stop that intertwining and integrating and showing miracles in the earth. The Most High withdrew it all, and we are now in a millennium where it was prophesied that we will be completely forsaken. 
toward the latter end, the Most High shall reintroduce himself unto us. Let's finish that. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Most High, and shall not find it. That's why in these latter days right now, it is so important that you make your calling and election sure. There's a lot of people preaching, but they're preaching things that are totally antithetical to truth. The Most High tells us to search diligently for the truth, and when we find it, sell it not. And so those that are in that listening vicinity and agree, keep this truth, because there has been a dearth of it. Let's read. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. Thirst for what? They're going to faint for thirst of righteousness. And so when he was talking to the woman at the well, he was talking about if you drink of this water, you would never thirst again. You would never be ostracized. You would never have darkness with the Heavenly Father. You will know his will and you will never be thirsty for him because he will always be there to quench your desires. This is what he's talking about. And this is what we must do in these last days. Stay close to the Heavenly Father. Never be thirsty. Always be quenched and one with our Abba. We're going to slide over to St. John 7, verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Yahweh shall stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So knowing what we know, he stood up at the Feast of Tabernacle and said, If any man thirst, for the Most High, and want to know the truth about Abba, he that believeth on what I'm bringing forth, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. The same waters in Genesis 1 that brought dead things to life, or brought nothing and made it something. What is he talking about? Out of his belly shall nothing produce something. Let's get 1 Peter 1.13. 1 Peter 1.13 Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Ah, now, wherefore, gird up the loins, the belly of your mind. This is what the Messiah is talking about. Not your actual stomach, your colons, and all of that. Once again, Hebrew phraseology. He says, out of your belly, which is the womb of your mind, shall flow rivers, fountains, of living water. He turned back and told Peter, gird up, protect the belly of your mind. And now in that belly or that mind, read, be sober. Be sober. Be focused. All right? Don't be double-minded. A drunk man sees two, and so he's drunk. But to be sober, you see one thing, and I'm headed for that. Let's read. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Yahweh Shai Christ. All right, and so hope for the gift that comes at the end. Let's read. As obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which have called you, you is holy, so be ye holy. So we have a job as the Most High is set apart from this wicked and dark evil world. We have been charged to be set apart as well. And do the things of the Most High as opposed to doing the things of this world. For time's sake, let's jump down to 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying truth through the Spirit unto unformed love of thy brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So now that you're seeing that you purify your soul. And so that lowing of your belly He's talking about your soul or your consciousness, your mind. You purified it. And how do you purify it? Consciously keeping the oblations at your frontal lobe, continuing in and those spiritual sacrifices. Seeing you have purified your soul in obeying the truth, through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure and fervent mind. All right, remember what was said. Out of your mind now shall flow rivers of living waters now remember your mind now is being contrasted to a womb or the loins 
Let's read the next verse, 23. Being born again. You're now born again. We've already talked about the parable of the Messiah. Born by the water, which is the baptism that we've talked about, utilizing it to come from dead to alive, and by the blood. And that blood is Ecclesiastes, Sirach 5015, the blood of grapes in your drink offering. But you're being born again. He's going to now put in another point. And not to be salacious or perverse, he's going to use the contrast of a physical birth to the spiritual conception as well. Let's read. Not of corruptible seed. Not of physical semen. Read. But of in incorruptible. Incorruptible seed. Now where did the seed go? Knowing that your womb is your mind. Read. By the word of Abba. The Messiah is putting that seed in your mind. Now we could take that seed and say it's a seed putting in the ground, but those thoughts that he's putting in your chamber of imagery, you can either take the seeds, the thoughts of the Messiah, or you could take the seeds, the thoughts of Hasatan. Hasatan, as we already discussed, he said, don't be deceived. Hasatan is called a deceiver. For he will try to take away the important and the principal matters of the Most High. He'll take it away and say you got to work. He'll take it away and say that's not important. He'll take it away and say sacrifice is done away with and we don't do those things anymore. But if you keep your heart pure and if you always acquiesce to the seed, the thought that the Messiah is putting in your head, you will reap a bountiful harvest at the 50th day. Let's finish that. Which lived and abided forever. He lives and abided forever. So now he gave us that parabolic meaning right now, your chamber of imagery must be protected at all cost. Meaning you do not let Hasatan come in and wreak havoc in your chamber. And sometimes you have to isolate your people from some of his, uh, yourself from some of his agents. You know, you might have a satanic sister, satanic nephew, satanic brother. You may go around and salute and be gone because the longer you stay around, the more they like a jackhammer prying at your dome to get in and infiltrate and to cause you to go astray. And so you can't have your chamber of imagery infiltrated, ambushed by the adversary. He said that we have to be born again. Let the seeds of Hamashiach, the Messiah, be dropped in your chamber and protected. We're born again, not of corruptible seed, physical, but we're born of the word who lay those thoughts in our chamber of imagery. Our mind is like an incubator, like ovaries of a woman's womb. And he's putting in thoughts, and Satan is coming like that dragon trying to abort the baby as soon as it's conceived. And that thought may be, I'm coming to the Feast of Weeks. Satan said, no, you're not. Abort that thought. I'm going to come, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go get some of that tights, man. I'm going to send X amount to the school. I'm going to bring some to the house. I'm going to be on that oblation line. His thought, no, you're not. He's coming in with the scalpel and all the abortion utensils needed to try to rip that thought right out of your chamber of imagery. You have to prevent him from aborting if you're ever going to be Moses, if you're ever going to be Abraham, if you're ever going to be those great men who survived that cataclysm, that, that great monstrous event that came upon us, always trying to destroy the saints as soon as they are born on the earth. Let's move over to 1 John. Saint John, uh, 1 John 3 verse 9 let's read that really quick and if you would Samach, get Ezekiel 8 verse 12 whoso is born of Abba doth not commit sin check that out whosoever has baptized and have drank of the cup and continue every day they don't do what? doth not commit you sin you don't commit sin because we know what sin is versus trespass Every day we give those oblations, we thwart off, wart off those spirits of sin, those demonic spirits of sin. Now we may do wrong, that's called a trespass, but we do not create more spirits. We war against the millions that we constantly battle against, okay? It's, a, it's one less today. I keep going and I'm going to get rid of them. But I do not trespass, let it go unmitigated, and then heap on another 50. Every day you take your daily bread and you stay battling against these evil spirits is what he's saying. So in your chamber of imagery, in that place where you are to keep 
pious, separated, holy to the Heavenly Father, you clean it up so that the Messiah can drop thoughts, parabolically called seed, in your womb. And it's up to you if you're going to let it get aborted, or it's up to you if you don't eat healthy, you smoke, you drink alcohol, parabolically speaking. Meaning you're hanging out with all the undesirables. That thought is about to get aborted. It's about to get aborted. You need to be a woman on a retreat somewhere in the wilderness eating healthy, eating the folic acid, doing everything you need to make sure this thought comes out. And that thought may be come to the feast. That thought may be I'm going to feed the homeless. That thought may be that I'm going to get this virtue. Don't let it be aborted in the midst of this feast. Let's read that again, priest. First John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of Abba doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of Abba. His seed that the Messiah gave him, and he put in his chamber of imagery, stayed within him. He fought to keep it. I got a thought, I'm coming to the Feast of Weeks, and... I don't care what Satan try to do to try to abort this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. And then when you get here and you offer your, that baby is born. <laughs> parabolically speaking. You fulfill the thought that the Messiah put in your chamber of imagery. Do not let these godly thoughts be aborted in this feast of week, people. He's putting these thoughts in the womb of your mind. Ezekiel speak about the exact same thing. Let's get Ezekiel 8 verse 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancient of the house of Israel do in the dark? Even man in the, in the chamber of imagery, in his chamber of imagery. For they say, the Most High sees us not. So the children of Israel got so comfortable doing wickedness. And he said that their chamber of imagery, think upon that new folk. What is the chamber where you imagine things? It's your mind. That's what the images are. And that's that universal language. I don't care what language you speak. You can certain things you can say. You can do the thumbs up. Everybody know what that means. But when it comes to the spirit, the Most High is speaking to you in thoughts and images. Thoughts and images. And you can think something. This is why they advertise so much. They can put out there something as abominable as a lobster. But it's all shining. They sprinkle that lemon all on it. And you got people licking their lips. You know, that, that image means something delicious. It got you questioning your covenant. And so, the same thing with your addiction. You could be an alcoholic. The image of some liquor coming, yeah. Pictures of drugs, yeah. Picture of women, uh. Do not let that circumvent what the Most High has put in your chamber of imagery is what he's saying. You got a chamber of imagery. You got to keep out those negative images and keep in the images of godliness. How do you keep out those negative images? You scrub them out by the sin offering. Scrub them out by the trespass offering. Peter said it. I think we're going to go there in a minute. He says, cast away all guile, malice, wickedness, perversion. How do you do it? Offer that spiritual sacrifice. And once you exterminate the thought, the body goes somewhere else. But you have to go to war. Those are all seeds of Hasatan. You got like the ovaries in there. Satan is sliding in his seeds. You got to reject that and keep the seeds that the Messiah gave you. Let's go to Mark 1 verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem. And were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locust and wild honey. And preaching, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John came preaching to the people, showing them there's a way to get rid of sin. The Pharisees, Sadducees, they didn't agree with him. But he knew that he was called to the Most High. But he says, I am only here to bring forth he that is greater than me. And he wore a prophet's garment. The prophets wear things of animals. And this is why he could wear 
camel's hair, which was an unclean animal. You could not eat a camel, but how could you wear the hair? Because according to the scriptures, you shear it before it's dead. The scriptures say when it dies, it becomes unclean. All right, that was just a footnote. But they did these things to prove that he was a righteous saint of the Most High. He wore the uniform of a prophet of the Most High. He said, he that come after me shall baptize thee with the Holy Spirit. Where? In your spirit. He's coming to clean your womb that was once filled with the seed of Hasatan. And so the battle is in your chamber of imagery. This is why it's written, no man can save you. You have to save yourself. If it was about scrubbing your external, I could come and do that. But I can't dig in that mine and scrub it. You got to want it. And you got to apply the bomb. You got to apply the soap, which is a trespass and a sin offering to ensure that your consciousness, your womb is fit enough to receive the seeds of the Messiah, the Prince. He says it in 1 Peter 2. Let's get 1 Peter 2, 1. Wherefore, line aside all malice and all guile, and, and hypocrites hypocrisy hip, so like it, hypocrisy and envies and all evil speaking so look at what he's saying let's read it laying aside out of your chamber of imagery all malice that's in your chamber of imagery all guile hypocrisies all envies and evil speaking how do you do it let's read as as newborn babies once again newborn babes you took the water of the baptism, you took the blood, the blood of grapes, you took the meat, you took all of those things needed, and you began to engage in what? Jump down to the fifth verse. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up as spiritual as a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to our Abba by the Yahweh Christ. This is how you get rid of malice and guile, hypocrisies, envies, evil speaking, lies, wrath, anger, perversion, and all manner of sinister dark things by the spiritual sacrifice offered to the Most High by our High Priest, the Messiah, the Prince. Let nobody beguile you people. The Feast of Weeks is an accelerated time for those who seek to exterminate these things out of their chamber of imagery. As a man think it, so is he. If your mind says, go and murder this person, it's highly likely you're going to go and murder that person. Nobody slipped into murder. Nobody just slipped into, ah, uh, they may have an accident, they may be something else, but murder is, I hate his guts. There's a gun right there. Let me go, pow, pow, pow. Now you might regret afterward, but you thought on it first. And so if you can clean the chamber of imagery, there is no pow, pow, pow. If you can clean the chamber of imagery, all the aforementioned begin to assuage. You begin to be a new person born again. Once we understand this, people, we'll stop the fakery. Hmm. You know what I mean, going to church and got on a clean suit. But your mind is dirty as a gutter. This is the fakery that we shouldn't even do anymore. We, should, we, shouldn't, we should be fed up with it. I want to be clean in spirit. I don't care about the outside of the cup. I want my inside to be clean. Because that's what the Most High is looking at. We're going to move from there. As we begin to try to bring this class to a close. As we talk about the feast of weeks, the second week, how the Most High created water in the first phase of creation. In the second phase, I should say, uh, the second day. And that water is a similitude in this second in this uh, feast of weeks, the second week, that we use to, to um, be a demarker of us who were dead to be coming back to life, to be those who come back to life. Out of that dead water, that dumb water came living things, and that's us. We should be looking to come alive in this second week, come back to Abba. These are the gifts that we ask for. I know some of us are going to be asking for, you know, monetary things. Most people are going to ask for that. But if you really knew the power, like the woman at the well, he said, if you really knew who you was talking to, I will give you some living water. You will never thirst again. Our ultimate gift should be, I will send forth the Holy Spirit to show me what the most I want. And then give me the energy to do his will. 
If you do that, that's the best thing I can ever get. All the other things are peripheral to it. Everything else is secondary. We're going to move over to Ephesians 5.26. The Messiah stood up, took the charge, and said in your chamber of imagery, I'm going to bless all of you by cleaning it. Let's get it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Let's pay close attention. That the Messiah may sanctify and cleanse your chamber of imagery with the washing of water by the word, the Messiah, the Prince, not scriptures. Anybody who's thinking that Leviticus the 11th chapter told me not to eat pork, so I've been baptized. You are in grave error, great error. What you really need to do is back up and understand that the Messiah has came to wash, has come to wash your chamber of imagery. Remember, there's the seeds of Hasatan sitting in your chamber. We need a mental and intellectual douche. Clean it. Wash it out. It's infected. We got a yeast infection in our consciousness. Get it all out. Most High is not putting any seeds in there and it's all jacked up. Chlamydia all over the place. We need some black walnuts spiritually. We need all types of anti-yeast herbs in our chamber of imagery. And this is what he's saying, that that water, when you undergo that baptism, if it brought nothing and made living creatures come out of it, you are nothing. He said he's going to bring the people that are to nothing by the people that are nothing. You are nothing, or you were nothing. And by that baptism, you, like the fish and all the other animals that came out of the water, are coming back to life. Let Genesis, the first chapter, the second day, happen with you in this second week. Let it happen. Confess the truth. Mosai is making something right now. The Mosai is doing a thing right now. And let the third day come around. It's coming. This week we started already. The Mosai is now in the third phase of creation, bringing plants and all manner of vegetation. Make sure that you're offering. Remember, he was telling the angels, the Godhead, what to make. And so he's telling you what to do. In this third week, have a high focus and concentration on making sure your tights come through. And then we're going to move over to the fourth, talking about the appropriate times. And then the fifth, the dividing of the land and the water. Then the sixth, let us make man in our image. This is what we're expecting in that sixth week. We're expecting the Most High to convert some people, change some people, clean our chamber of imagery out where we are more like the Most High and more unlike flesh and bone read Ephesians 5 26 once again that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word the washing of water by the word who is our high priest who administers the baptism read on verse 27 that he might present it to him a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. So the Messiah is fully ready to wash our chamber of imagery. Remember, people, we trespass what we sin not. And that's what he ultimately is trying to get rid of. A diminishing of those evil spirits of sin. All those evil thoughts. Once they are gone, you have overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. And when you overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, he is now falling out of heaven or your chamber of imagery. And imagine Hasatan completely out of your chamber. We just covered this in the Daughters of Wisdom class. There's going to be war in your chamber of imagery. And we're that generation right now that is suffering. And the kingdom of heaven or your consciousness suffered violence and Satan take it by force. As the scriptures say. But Michael and his angels are here to help and assist. We just got to do our part. And a time will come where he will be utterly dethroned, kicked out. Now, as Paul said, let's reverse it. The things I want to do, I do. The things that I don't want to do, I don't do them. It's no longer I, but the Holy Spirit that dwelleth in me when he's gone. This is the conversion that we're looking for. This is what's going to produce mighty soldiers, men and women of the Most High, ready for that ultimate conversion of the first resurrection. Let us understand how important these principal times are right now. 
The Most High has given us a high holy day for a specific reason, for we can, so that we may regenerate ourselves, so that we may be made powerful and be the sons and daughters of light in these latter days. So he's going to do the washing of the water by the word, our consciousness, sprinkling our consciousness, purifying our consciousness. Now Moses had the same thing, a very similar thing. And so we know how the sixth covenant works. As Moses did it, it was a stepping stone to how we're going to do it. And so we offer the sacrifices spiritual. The law is spiritual. The statutes and commandments are still carnal. So let's look at how he did this law. Exodus 30 verse 17. And the Most High spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a lever of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacles of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. All right, so the Most High told Moses that you shall make a laver of brass, which is copper and silver, antimicrobial. And he said, put water in it. That same water from Genesis, where nothing became something. And you're going to take these dead folk that was filled with trespass and sin, you're going to wash them. And then you're going to take that altar and you're going to get that oblation. And these dead folk are going to come to life. They're going to get closer to me, alive, lively people. They're going to be no more dead, separated. They're going to be close to Abba. But use that water. The water has purpose. You think it's for jet skiing and boating around? That water is for the rekindling of people who have gone astray. Yeah, I know you may, through this Feast of Week, be on vacation somewhere in the Caribbean. But that water wasn't made for sunbathing. That water was made for you to baptize and come back to the Heavenly Father. That's the principal point of that water. Yeah, you may do sunbathing peripherally, but the main purpose is for worshiping of the Heavenly Father. Let's read on. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. They shall wash their hands and their feet. And so like Aaron and his sons, we may come to wash hand or feet. And so by that water, drenching your hand, submerging your hand or your feet, you find yourself once estranged from the Heavenly Father, once separated, once in a dark place. And now coming back to life so that you can populate the earth and regenerate. Once you know the importance of water, you'll never look at it the same. You'll never look at it the same. Let's read on. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. That they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to, be, to burn offering made by fire unto the Most High. Not to take it on a long tangent, said nothing about full submergence, said wash their hands and their feet. And we know that the sixth, sixth covenant is reflected in the seventh covenant. And it says you must do this when you come to every oblation that you die not. What do you mean die? You think like lightning going to come down? No, that you're not separated from the heavenly father. You remember, the Holy Spirit of wisdom is more moving than any motion. As soon as you start making a habit of doing something wrong, she's out, ghost, gone. And all of a sudden, all that bright light, energy, knowledge, information that you had, you ain't got nothing now. Because you became stoic and hardcore and backwardness. So we must always be nimble and flowing, agile, being one with the Most High, but manyfold, very diverse, ready to go any way he wants us to go. And so he's saying here that that water is for taking people who are already dead, separated from the Heavenly Father, and bringing them close to the Heavenly Father. And people who are close to the Most High, keeping them alive. The water has purpose. The water has purpose given from the Heavenly Father. Let's drop that. We're going to move over to Exodus. Stay in Exodus, uh, AP of Mark, the 40th chapter. And we'll pick it up in the 29th verse, Exodus 40, verse 29. So in the second week, as we begin to close this class, brothers and sisters, let us remember that there was and is a point that we need to focus on. Abba, we need to come back to thee. And as those who are in the covenant, and they are on the oblation uh, conference line that we have. And when the priest said baptize or get that fresh water, you now do it now with a greater stride, with a greater understanding. 
is that now if the Most High from nothing made fish and all the animals come out of the water, he can make me who is nothing come out of it as well. Let that water run down upon me like a mighty water and like a mighty stream. So that once again in this spiritual oblation, my chamber of imagery will be cleansed. Hasatan's seed, his thoughts will be taken out. And I will have only exclusively the thoughts of the Messiah, the Prince. And those thoughts are, you'll get them through dreams and visions. The Most High give you thoughts of goodness and greatness and things that you need to be accelerating in the midst of the feast. And if you let them things incubate, you let them things come through their trimester, you let them things crown and birth, blessed be you for bringing that thing fully into the world. Exodus 40, verse 29. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offerings as the Most High command Moses. And he said, a laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water therein to wash it with all. And Moses and Aaron and his son washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the tap congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Most High commanded Moses. So now we see how our brethren in antiquity behaved themselves in the sixth covenant. Remember, the seventh covenant is a schoolmaster or mimicry of the sixth covenant. It was an example of what we do in the seventh covenant. The only thing changed is the law, which means Torah, which means the way we sacrifice. We do it like Peter said, spiritual now. We still do it in the high holy days. We still do it in the feast, the days of remembrance, the days of spiritual fasting. But right now, as they did in antiquity, let us now break up our fallow ground. Let us now put hand to plow. Let us now put our hand to the sickle and begin to take and harvest the fruit of good works. Let us now take our valiant acts like Tobit, Tobias, and Anna and begin to work the work within our community, bringing forth good works. But let us not neglect the priest of the Most High by sending forth the tithes so that we may have a full storehouse to always offer the Most High his holy oblations. And let us experiment with this. Be good with your experiments. Just like a physical scientist, let us be a spiritual scientist. Keep notes of what you did. I went out 10 a.m. I fed those who was hungry. I gave away 32 bags. Gave away 15 bottles of water. I get this, I get that. And then I helped the brother over here with his rent. He needed $40 or whatever. You just keep notes of everything. And then on that 50th day, when we get that oblation, you proclaim it to the Most High. Ain't nothing evil about that. He told you to do it. He told you to experiment. You keep track because he keeping track. Ain't nothing about that off. And you, Abba, this is what I did. You say that a blessing would come upon me. And wait for the winds to come upon you. And what there is a dearth of in your world, watch faithfully as he began to complete it, seal it up, so that you are stronger for the sole purpose of offering more peace and thanksgiving offerings unto the Heavenly Father. Let us prepare in this second week to close it and bring together the third week. This third week, as it was in the third phase of creation, was to bring forth all of the vegetation upon the land. So in this third week of the feast, make sure that you send in all of your tights. Send in a bountiful harvest of tight. Let the storehouse run over. And then we'll move over the following week and talk about what we need to do in the um the fourth and fifth week all right we're going to end the class on that note and as we always do we're going to open it up i'll be willing for anybody who have any questions i pray that the holy spirit the rakak wadash ruach bring forth answers all right let's start anybody in the congregation first and then we'll move over to anybody that's online All right, anything in the audience? 
All right, we're going to move online then uh, while you guys getting your, your notes together. All right, we got anything online? Um, yeah, the uh, firstly, the brother Anon, um, he's been coming on uh, pretty frequently talking about the, the Gentiles of the New Testament uh, were Israelites. He said the Samaritan woman uh, that was referred to earlier was an Israelite. Um, he talks about 1 Maccabees 12 confirming this, and he says, you know, that the Spartans were um, Israelites. You know, they're referring to the people of Cyrene, Libya, and all that, saying the, that the Gentiles in the New Testament are Israelites. Um, so I guess he's not really posing a question, but um, I know he's been posting this for the past few weeks. Right. So um, I don't know if there's uh, anything need to be said on that. You know, I would respectfully address the brother that um, we're talking about something of great power, and it's completely going over your head, my brother. If you want to talk about Jew and Gentile, that's a whole other class. Why don't you extract the more salient points out of this class that we are in the Feast of Weeks, and you need to be going out feeding the homeless or the hungry, whether Jew or Gentile, and getting that virtue so at the 50th day you can receive a great gift. And it seems to me you should be praying for a gift of understanding. A gift of understanding. The Messiah clearly had us dispersed among blood-born heathens. We can talk about this in another class. How the circumcision, Paul told the Gentiles straight up, you don't get circumcised. These were not Israel. Paul has not the authority to tell an Israelite not to get circumcised. He would be put to death first and foremost by the Most High. Read it in Acts 15, my brother. We understand that the Maccabees talked about the Spartans being of our countrymen. Israel has been dispersed all over the place. But there are other people that are of Abraham that they call countrymen. Esau is a countryman. He's a close relative, closer than anybody. He's even closer than Ishmael that they were called brethren at one point. But I'm not going to get sidelined. Once again, I would tell you, all of that come from the camp, the school that I was a part of. One West, 125th Street, Universal Church of Practical Knowledge. I'm all aware of it. And I tell you what, if you want, my brother, send us an email. Send us an email at houseofwisdom.how uh, at gmail.com. And what we'll do, send your contact information. We'll have somebody to talk with you in a better setting than this. I'm pretty sure that nothing's going to get done by you, you know, putting up your thoughts. And then we're addressing it like this. And it's actually dist distracting from those who people who want to uh, really learn. So if you really want to know, uh, one of the priests, or even myself, or Yara Dunn, Executive Priest Yara Dunn, may reach out to you to have that conversation with you. I appreciate your zeal. I know that you're fervent for the Heavenly Father. I see how you stick in. But it seems like to me that you're missing the great meat and depth that the Heavenly Father is throwing out in these beautiful classes. This is not even a class about the Gentile. This is a class about you. This is a class about your filthy, dirty mind getting wiped clean. You need to ask yourself that. Are you addicted to something? Is this something that you can't stop doing, Brother Anon? If it is, you got that thing in your mind that is insatiable or insatiable. It is that spirit of sin and we're offering right now in the new covenant the sin offerings to help you out, my brother. So I'm not going to argue and debate about the Gentiles with you. Get Email us, send us your number, and one of us will reach out to you, my brother. You got another question? Yeah. Um, Dolo79 uh, asked... Uh, question what's the difference between a christian and muslim rebirth i see they changed the life completely so what's the difference great point actually the hebrews are the originators and like any original thing you get the great value brand you get that knockoff all right and so this is what they done remember the muslims came in what was it the 600s or the 7th century a.d we're talking about a fairly young you know, uh, religion, so to speak. We was already broken down, dispersed all in the interiors of Africa, scattered all over. And so they just extrapolated our stuff. Things that we was engaged in, they began to incorporate. And now the Christians, particularly the Orthodox, whether it be the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, or the Catholic Church, they saw how the Hebrews took the bread, oil, and wine, and they was forbade from ever doing it. But after 70 A.D., our destruction and being dispersed, they turned around and said, we're going to take it upon ourselves to be the priest. Knew not what we was doing. They would see us heave the bread 
and then waved the bread and they thought we was making a cross. And so they started putting cross trinkets upon their necks, hanging it upon the wall and doing all types of abominations with it. The difference is we are the originators and we the only one that can bear this cross. No Gentile can bear this cross. Whether they are Christian or Islam, whether they are Buddhist or into whatever, they cannot engage in these oblations or perform them. They can receive them from a priest. As you said earlier, we are saved by faith, as Paul said, but they are saved through faith, meaning through us who facilitate the oblations. That's the difference betwixt us and them, my brother. Anything else? Anything? Okay, in the audience. Shalom. Shalom says. Beautiful class. All um, praises to Abba. All praises. With Exodus 40, uh, verses 30 through 32, could we precept that with St. John's chapter 13, where Christ was um, baptizing the disciples, and was that the segue into them being cleansed to um, allow the Holy Spirit to, to enter in? Uh, let's get that real quick. It says St. John. Chapter 13. Um starting us uh, verse 6 or right. 4 verse 4 really go ahead and get that uh, AP smock St. John 13 verse 4 yes alright he raised he, ra he raised from the supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. You know what? Let's start the first verse real quick. Huh. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Yahweh knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the adversary having now put into the heart of Judas Esachera, Simon's sons, to betray him. Right on point, sis. So we see uh, Judas Iscariot being right there at the table at the Passover, and Satan, the devil, entered into his heart, biblically mean his mind, his chamber of imagery. So he wasn't protecting the loins of his mind. He wasn't girding up. And a thought came and said, kill Christ, murder him, or turn him over to the Romans and let him kill them. And he should have aborted that thought, fought that thought, but he's like, that's a good idea. So he started sleeping with that thought in his chamber of imagery, and it was the beginning of his demise. Let's read. Yahweh Shai, knowing the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from Abba. And went to Abba. He raised from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. So after the Passover, Pesach given that oblation, a time when Israel entered into the covenant coming out of uh, Egypt, he turned around and said, I'm going to bring my apostles into this covenant. He turned down, took a towel, and what did he do? He girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin. He poured water in a basin equivalent to that brazen laver that, as you appropriately quoted, sis, out of Exodus 40, he made his own laver, according to the new covenant. Read on. And began to wash the disciples' feet. Just like Moses did with his Aaron, that he did with Aaron's children. Why? Because they was preparing to give more sacrifices as mentioned in Exodus 40. Read. And to wipe them with the tower wherewith he was girded. And he began to wash their hands and their feet. And the story goes on. Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. He said, if you don't let me wash your feet, knucklehead, you cannot be my disciple. Peter turned around and said, wash everything. My ear, my eyeballs, my hair. Wash my hair, my feet. He was like, look, man. I just need to wash your hand and your feet. That proves you didn't need a full submersion like these people teach and talk. So he washed hands and feet following the statute that was given to Moses, but really it comes from Genesis in the second phase. Peter was dead. And so like the dumb dead waters, 
the Messiah was bringing him alive, meaning bringing him closer to Abba. And at that point, they were becoming the children of the Most High. So good point, sis. Right on point. This is the Messiah definitely incorporating the baptism like John in the seventh covenant. And this is why it's so critically important that each and every one of us be consecrated by the water like a newborn babe. That means the baptism and the blood, which is the blood of grapes, the drink offering and the meat offerings. These are the things we need to become born again. And when you are consecrated, that's your new birth date, a born date. That is the date you came into the covenant. That is the date the Most High called you a child and you became his daughter or son. And then we must stay alive, never die again, never sin again. And those who are in the know know, just because you did something wrong, you ain't sin. We're talking about new spirits added on to your plethora of them that you have. You battle the ones you got until you get rid of them. But don't let new ones. How do you keep new ones from coming in? I'm holding down my daily bread. I'm in Hakaz. I'm in Abiah. I'm in a lot of Yeshua. I'm in Shechaniah. I'm in Eliashib. I'm in Yakim. I'm in all the lots. So how can sin grow if I'm part and parcel of the frying of them all? It will not. And a time will come when you will get the edge on them. It will be more oblation than it is of spirits of sin. And the tables will turn at that point. It will be an accelerated ratcheting up of things. Ratcheting down the spirit of sin and burning them. And this is when you are now taking full possession of your chamber of imagery. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Um, Brother Aaron Collier. He asks, uh, Shalom family, does Abba send us warnings in our chamber of imagery in the form of dreams? If so, how do we give offerings as sacrifices to the Most High Abba to avoid these outcomes? Also, do I send double tithes to give sin offerings for my enemies in this feast of weeks? Or how do I try to give them blessings spiritually to gain virtue? A uh, lot of questions. Let's, let's start with the first one. Read that one again. Does Abba send us warnings in our chamber of imagery in the form of dreams? Con, con, he does quite often. And he'll deal with it in a way that's unique to you. Some of the things you've been through is different than what I've been through. Like I said, it's, it's, it's certain people mean things to you. And so he will send those warnings to you so that you can prevent the path that you're on. And if he sent a warning, that's a blessed thing. That means he loves you. He cares for you. He's letting you know, I don't want you going that way. I see Hasatan creeping in front of your house. It's pretty much like an alarm system saying, hey, you got burglars outside. And so a wise man would turn around and make sure all his windows locked. He's girded up and got his weaponry out, making sure nobody invades his home. So surely he sends uh, those warnings. But you want to make sure before you start discerning and deciphering dreams that your chamber of imagery is clean and clear. Satan likes to send things out there to make everything murky and convoluted. Clean your chamber of imagery so that you can be more precise, especially with interpreting your dreams and visions. What was the second part of that? If so, how do we give offerings or sacrifices to the Most High Abba to avoid these outcomes? Well, you may not want to avoid that outcome. You may want to enhance those outcomes. As I said before, or as the scriptures say, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that vision is talking about a vision from a prophet. And so if a prophet is not there like Jeremiah is saying, Thus saith the Most High our Abba. The Babylonians are coming and they're going to destroy you. He had the vision. He gave them a warning. But they would not change. They would not convert. They wouldn't do it. And so the outcome came upon them. And so the answer to that would be, again, clear your chamber of imagery by first and foremost entering into the seventh covenant. And once you enter into the seventh covenant, we got all 12 lots of the day watch, 12 hours of the day covered by the priesthood. And what we do is offer that internationally to all the members and call in and they will walk you through the oblation together, collectively, united. They will utilize the water that we have just spoken about in a baptism, a seventh covenant spiritual baptism. And then they will use the olive oil, the anointing oil as well to sanctify you and dedicate you in that lot to the most high. And they will begin the, um, the ecclesiastical rites 
the liturgical rite the Most High has afforded us to continue on with the oblation and complete it up to roast, fry, and remove all spirits of sin from your chamber of imagery. Is there another portion of that? Yeah. Um, the other portion was, um, also do I send double tithes to give sin offerings for my enemies in this feast of weeks? Or how do I try to give them blessings spiritually to gain virtue? Well, it is all upon you. As you feel, give. All right. Most I got a portion called a free will offering. But as you give more tights, I tell you as a fact, what happens is more of your bread, oil, and wine is used in an oblation. And when you send that, that's like an ambassador for you. Your wine, as all the priests drink it in that drink offering, you're like a third party in there now. You are directly responsible for that drink. So yes, send as much tithes as possible, become consecrated, enter into the seventh covenant, and as they administer the trespass and the sin offering and the peace and thanksgiving offering, you now mention your enemies in there. Whatever you want to convert them, to give them a changed heart, or to stop them in their tracks, whatever it is, cry out to Abba. This is what we're offering right now at this present moment. Think that's it on that? All right, any more questions along? That's it. All right, we've got one in the audience. All praises, beautiful class. Um, all praises to Awaba. All praises. Uh, in Second Ezra, at the beginning of class, you were talking about in Second Ezra 9 and 9. I was, my question is, does that coincide with Hebrews 10 and 29? All right, you'll get that. Um, AP Samak. Con. You got it? Uh, you call the chapter and verse again? Second Esdras 9 and 9. And does that coincide with Hebrews 10 and 29? All right, Hebrews 10, 29. Second, er, Ezra 9, verse 9. Then shall they be in pitiful, in pitiful case, which now have abused my ways. And they that have cast them away despitefully shall dwell in torment. Go to, um, you said, what, Matthew 10? No. Um, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. You'll yes. read that. We covered this in the Daughters of Wisdom class, but you're saying, is it applicable to here? Yes. All right, let's get that. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trod under foot the son of Abba, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Of course, it's the exact same thing, right? They considered this gracious covenant given unto them by our Abba an ungodly thing. And they did spite to the spirit of grace, mercy, and charity. The Heavenly Father had all rights to exterminate us. He could have got rid of us because the covenant is contingent upon us being righteous. But he loved us when we didn't love him. Love is keeping the commandments. So he kept his word with us when we didn't keep word with him. And so he turned around by grace, even though you don't deserve this, I'm going to give you this seventh covenant. But what if we stand up and say, I don't want it. People who were literally slated for death, the electric chair is coming right a couple of hours. And he said, I'm going to give you freedom. I don't want it. Give me electric chair. Well, you're going to get the electric chair. And you're going to get worse than that. Firing squad too after you are electrocuted. So this is the punishment and pain that is coming upon those who do not accept this seventh covenant, the covenant of David, that the Messiah, the Prince, sprinkled his blood upon to activate. And it's been active since he did that, almost 2,000 years. But we're just now catching wind of it and now utilizing it prophetically in these last days. And so I'll... Uh, segue into again this is the end of the second week where we preach coming from the dead the waters that were dumb and dead coming back to life we are now preparing ourselves to get into the third week of this feast of seven weeks and we should be focused on tights we should be focused on the herbs the greenery the grasses that the heavenly father brought in that third phase in this third week that's exactly what we should be focused on let everybody go to Shechaniah.com Order your tights. Send it to the priest. We are going to be utilizing it on the 50th day, praying that everybody who 
sent forth their tithes receive a double portion or more from the heavenly father and that all of our desires and hopes and dreams and needs come to pass so in this third week that we're entering in right now do not fail do not neglect to sow seeds, plant it so that we can harvest. Remember, he that put forth sparingly shall reap a small amount. And who, he who put a bountiful harvest uh, seed in the ground shall reap a bountiful harvest indeed on that 50th day. All right, with that, we're going to stop it. We're going to close the class. I bid you well. May the Most High bless us all. May peace and thanksgiving reign supreme within our chamber of imagery. And may we complete this second complete this third week and ultimately complete seven weeks reach the 50th day and may blessings come down upon us all shalom